Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, no, I did not just raise the podium for uh, myself. <laughs> as uh, people can probably figure out. Um, welcome back to uh, the afternoon session of the first day of our privacy hearing. Uh, my name is Jim Trilling. I'm an attorney in the FTC's Division of Privacy and Identity Protection. This afternoon, we will have a panel discussion regarding consumer demands and expectations for privacy, and then a two-part panel discussion that will compare and contrast current approaches to privacy. But first, before we begin the panels, we are happy to have FTC Commissioner Noah Phillips here to provide remarks. Commissioner Phillips joined the commission in 2018. He previously served as chief counsel to Senator John Cornyn on the US Senate Judiciary Committee. While working in the Senate from 2011 to 2018, he advised Senator Cornyn on legal and policy matters in antitrust, constitutional law, consumer privacy, fraud, and intellectual property. He also previously worked in private practice as a civil litigator. With that brief introduction, it is my privilege to turn the podium over to Commissioner Phillips. The podium is still not high enough. <laughs> Story of my life. Um, thank you, Jim, for that introduction. Uh, and more importantly, thanks to the staff uh, at OPP and DPIP and elsewhere for their efforts putting together this hearing. Over the last year, as I'm sure many of you know, um, we've had a lot of really great hearings on a lot of really important topics, but I would be hard pressed to identify, um, just based on what I saw this morning watching from my desk, um, a more substantive conversation that is more needed right now, as I'll explain later. So really, uh, congrats uh, to all of you. Um, I have to start with the standard caveat, what I'm going to say today, and as you will soon realize, uh, are my own thoughts uh, and not necessarily the thoughts of my fellow commissioners or of the commission as a whole. Um, these hearings, the ones being conducted this week <coughs> on the FTC's approach to consumer privacy, reflect that we are in the midst of a very robust national and even international debate about consumer data privacy. For those who've been studying and advocating on these issues for years, many of whom are with us today, I hope this is a welcome development. I think it surely does reflect a great deal of perseverance on your part. But for many policymakers, for lawmakers, and for consumers, our consumer data privacy moment seems in large part to have come out of nowhere, and in a short time at that. News events about large tech companies, data breaches, politics here and in Europe, each and together too often lead this important debate to skip right past the basic groundwork that I think we need for a coherent policy discussion and from that a coherent policy outcome. Some people are freaked out and in some cases for good reason. Chairman Simons this morning noted that privacy violations can result in real and legally cognizable harms. But at core, the questions we face and the answers that we choose will have broad ramifications. So I'm concerned about how many have been talking about consumer data privacy, and I think you all should be too. Whatever your views are, I would hope we all agree that policy must be grounded in informed debate. So that's why I said at the beginning, the hearings that we are holding this week are critical to the national interest. And I'm particularly pleased to see that they began today with the topic of the first panel, a notionally modest but actually difficult and essential step, defining the goals of consumer data privacy. As I have repeatedly said, including to the Senate, in discussing consumer data privacy, we need first to distinguish between the operations of a privacy enforcement regime and the underlying harms we are trying to address. Too much of the discussion here in Washington and in op-ed pages has focused on questions like whether the FTC needs penalty authority, whether we need rulemaking authority, whether we need more money. These are important policy questions, don't get me wrong, but ultimately, they are derivative questions. Rulemaking, penalties, funding, these are merely tools. It is the substance, the harms we are addressing, 
and the rights that Congress intends to create to address those harms that require our primary attention. Privacy is a nebulous concept, and different people can and do conceive quite differently how individuals are harmed by a privacy violation. They also differ whether and to what extent they experience a given kind of conduct as a violation, and in how much they would pay to avoid it. Are consumer data privacy harms limited to physical injury and financial loss? Do they include emotional distress? Is a sense of surveillance or creepiness characteristic only of an eggshell plaintiff? Or is that something need, Congress needs to prevent? What about a lack of empowerment or a loss of control over data? And how, if at all, do these things take us back to Brandeis and Warren's famous right to be let alone? The decision as to which harms deserve vindication by Congress is the predicate for deciding how any law should look, including what, a li what liability scheme we should adopt, what we permit, what we prohibit, and under what circumstances, and then, and only then, what tools are appropriate for enforcing the rights that Congress creates. To me, at least, one area of general agreement jumps out for action. When the NTIA surveyed Americans in 2017, the number one harm they reportedly feared, or we reportedly feared, was identity theft. That makes sense to me. And that is why I think the most significant thing we can do for consumer data privacy is to improve data security. While we often discuss privacy and security disjunctively, they are in fact close relatives. And all five FTC commissioners agree on the need for data security legislation, including having the FTC's authority in this area codified, providing us with civil penalty authority to enhance deterrence, and giving the commission jurisdiction over common carriers and nonprofits. Moving that legislation forward would be a major win for consumers and a major accomplishment for privacy. To go beyond this area of agreement, as I said earlier, this week's hearings are critical. We are asking the basic questions we need to ask about what we should remedy, and then considering real questions about how the regime ought to look, the roles of notice and choice, access, deletion, correction, and accountability. The order of these conversations, not to mention the conversation themselves, is essential, and the nation and Congress ought to follow them. I focused in my remarks today and elsewhere a lot on Congress, and that is not by accident. Some months ago, I was invited to address the Privacy Coalition at Epic's offices and answer questions. After I gave a similar spiel about the need first to agree upon privacy harms that we would address, a participant asked me why I was focusing on harms and not rights. That is a great question. And the answer could not be more important. Unlike, say, in Europe, here in the United States, there is no basic right to consumer data privacy or at least not yet. Political philosophers locate the source of rights in God, in nature, in our emergence from the state of nature, or maybe stemming from some sort of Kantian reason. As a practical and legal matter, however, rights flow either from the Constitution or the laws Congress makes pursuant to it. The mere fact that I believe I have a right to something doesn't mean that I do. That is what the role of the democratic process is. Congress has, in fact, created consumer privacy rights, including ones that apply to data. We presently have a risk-based model where we sensibly guard more jealously information, the disclosure of which concerns us more. And Congress may, as we are now all discussing, create more general rights regarding consumer data privacy. But this is precisely the point. Congress needs to make those rights. The framers of our Constitution, who established a Republican form of government that has lasted for centuries, and that remains today a symbol of liberty and economic success the world over, relied heavily for inspiration on the philosopher John Locke. In 1690, Locke famously wrote, this is a quote, the power of the legislative being derived from the people by a positive voluntary grant and institution can be no other than what the positive grant conveyed, 
which being only to make laws and not to make legislators, the legislative can have no power to transfer their authority of making laws and place it in other hands. Our elected representatives in Congress, not an enforcement agency led by five unelected officials, are vested with the responsibility to make the fundamental value judgments that consumer data privacy legislation requires. For these choices to have legitimacy and authority, they must come from Congress. Not only would delegating the FTC too much rulemaking authority risk that legitimacy and authority, it poses other risks as well. I am concerned about the impact on the market of a set of far-reaching rules that could morph with electoral politics. Businesses, whether they like a particular law or not, need certainty and pre predictability so they can plan and make investments. These are crucial for them and for our economy. If substantial changes to the law are in the hands of just five people, the chance the rules of the world will change back and forth will, on its own, chill economic growth. And I'll add to it, I don't think it's particularly good for the agency to have to deal with that on a regular basis. Consider the consequences at stake here. The collection, use, and monetization of data is endemic in the economy. It is not just a few very noticeable firms. My children talk to Siri, and someday my toaster will talk to me. What, what will it tell me? This data-driven economy has provided incredible benefits to businesses and consumers. Even as we are facing questions about the negative aspects of that economic development, we need to make some conscious decisions about trade-offs balance sometimes competing goals, and develop good policy on the future of consumer data privacy. Think about the regulatory advantages held by large corporations and the impact of regulation on competition. A new set of rules has the potential to entrench the largest incumbents who are best able to navigate and finance compliance while posing substantial barriers to entry for smaller players, even as those rules further some privacy goals. Consider, for instance, data portability, a mechanism that many hope will facilitate competition. I share that hope. Last week, Isabel de Silva, the president of the French Merger Authority, told folks assembled at spring meeting about complaints she was hearing from French startups that data portability in the GDPR was enabling big companies to take their customers. We have to consider that. And this brings me to my next point. As I've said, any consumer data privacy law will involve trade-offs. And to be clear, they may be worth it. But we should make those decisions in an informed and honest manner, and where possible, achieve an optimal balance among different priorities, competition and consumer protection in particular. We and Congress should be data-driven and thoughtful, using existing research and commissioning new research when necessary. That means, among other things, taking the lessons we are learning from the impact of GDPR and applying them to our policy framework. I want to end on what, for me, is a critical point. We as a society are undergoing a major shift in how commerce is conducted. And however uncomfortable that may make some of us, it's not going to go away. We're not going to succeed like the samurai of old in keeping the guns off the island. By the way, that didn't ultimately work for them. And no matter what laws Congress passes, in a sense, they will never be enough. Prescriptive rules and law enforcement only go so far, especially without trade-offs that many do not want. To deal with what some have taken to calling the fourth industrial revolution, consumers and businesses, not just government, must play a role. Laws alone are not going to inculcate a sense of responsibility with regard to data, an ethical perspective, or a mentality of privacy by design. To accomplish this more fundamental shift in behavior and thinking, which can do more than any law enforcement agency with its limited resources can do to protect consumer privacy, we need to encourage companies across our economy and around the world to view consumer privacy as a core value, as a business differentiator for industry, and most of all, we need to encourage consumers 
to take their own privacy seriously. So here's my pitch. The discussion about consumer data privacy is one of the most complex policy debates we have had for a while, likely with dramatic economic, political, and social consequences. There may be no do-overs if we get it wrong. So let's go forward deliberately and carefully, taking short-term wins where the consensus is clear, as in data security, and making sure we are evaluating any new privacy regime with data and careful analysis. And let's work on developing a shared framework that helps consumers and businesses understand the value of consumer privacy so that any consumer data privacy legislation is built on that framework of shared values and a recognition of the importance of privacy. Laws work best when they reflect fully shared values. That's from Aristotle, and I don't know if Professor Ohm is still in the room, but that is quite literally antiquated. But it's still true, and it's really important. These hearings are a great example of the discussions that I think we need to have, maybe the best example. So to those of you in this room, um, and to those at home uh, who are watching, to people who have submitted comments or otherwise engaged, I want to say thank you. Thank you for engaging and debating, for putting meat on the bones of this privacy debate. And I look forward to learning from you now and in the future. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, um, and thank you to Commissioner Phillips for his remarks. Um, my name is Laura Van Druff. I'm an attorney in the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection, and I'm joined by my colleague Dan Gilman um, in the Office of Policy Planning. Um, and we are here with the first panel of the afternoon um, regarding consumer demand and expectations for privacy. I'd like to introduce my panelists with very short bios. The longer versions are in your packet. To my left is uh, Professor Lori Faith Craner, uh, Professor of Computer Science, Engineering, and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, immediately to her left is um, Avi Goldfarb, a professor of marketing and the uh, Rotman, Rotman, Rotman? Rotman. Rotman, excuse me, Chair in AI and Healthcare at the University of Toronto. Um, beside Professor Goldfarb is Ariel Fox Johnson, who is Senior Counsel of uh, Policy and Privacy at Common Sense. Um, beside Ariel is Jason Kint, CEO of Digital Content Next. Next to Jason is uh, Laura Peary, <laughs> um, Senior Counsel. Um, excuse me, senior, senior Legal Director and Data Protection Officer at Fitbit. And uh, last but not least is Heather West, who is Senior Policy Manager at Mozilla. Um, during our panel today, uh, a, a number of my colleagues, at least one of my colleagues, will be um, in the room distributing comment cards. If you have a question, or if anyone in our web audience has a question, you can tweet it at us, and uh, we would be pleased to try to integrate that. Those questions will be moderated through Dan and me. Um, so Dan, would you like to kick us off? Sure, thanks. So I'll, I'll start with a, a very broad policy question, some would say, overbroad, but maybe we can unpack it a little bit and then unpack it in the course of the discussion. So the simple version of this is, are consumer expectations and demands relevant to creating policy regarding privacy? So you could push for yes or no, but you could also perhaps uh, uh, push for a version of uh, when and uh, to what extent, what might be some policy substitutes or complements and enrich that a little bit. Um, so that's a question I'd like to start with Laura, if I can, and then, then have it open to the entire panel. 
Sure. Hello, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so are um, consumer expectations and demands um, relevant to privacy policy? I will say um, yes, absolutely. Um, and I think that um, in discussing um, and discussing what customers and consumers want regarding privacy, it's important to say that companies are very motivated to understand their customers' expectations regarding privacy so that they can deliver on them. And this is not just because um, privacy generates um, customer trust and goodwill, but because it is good for business. Um, sometimes when we talk about uh, privacy um, and companies' approaches to privacy, it is assumed that privacy is somehow different from other product attributes like the design of the product, the style, the product features, the product quality. And in fact, that is not the case. Companies um, are constantly assessing and responding to their customers' demands for privacy in the same way that they do for other product attributes. And I can give one specific uh, Fitbit example around this. Um, for, and for those of you who are not familiar with Fitbit, we provide hardware, software, and services that give our customers more insight into their health and fitness. Um, they purchase our, our Fitbit devices um, precisely so that they can collect certain activity information, including their steps and their sleep, um, their heart rate, their exercise maps, their food intake, and more. And we have a Fitbit app that shows our customers this information with a series of, of dashboards and data visualizations. So from early on in our company's history, we understood that our customers wanted the ability to take their information outside of the Fitbit app. They wanted to create their own custom visualizations, and they wanted um, insights about their data um, from data sets that were um, collected and generated by multiple apps and services that they use. So for example, other nutrition or exercise apps. Um, in short, they, they wanted um, what, you know, what we know of as data portability. Um, so data portability became an early tenant um, for Fitbit. The, um, and this is reflected in the early coding models that are um, that our co-founders, our, our CEO James Park and CTO Eric Friedman um, put together. These models reflected that our customers' data should be easily exported through an API. And in fact, in early 2011, not long after we launched our first device, about a year, a year after um, the first device, Fitbit device um, was introduced, we launched an API that enabled our users to extend the um, uses of their data and not long after that, we um, launched a data export tool that allowed people to download their data um, directly from the Fitbit website. So um, I mentioned all this to stress that this was in 2011. We launched our data export feature globally. This is well before we considered the GDPR or any um, data protection um, right to data portability. We did this to satisfy a consumer need and a, a demand that we saw within our uh, user community. Um, we did this you know, for business purposes rather than for any regulatory requirement. And I'll say that um, to this day, even now with the GDPR in effect, we, consider, we continue um, to consider our consumer <coughs> expectations um, first and foremost ahead of the regulatory requirement. So for example, last year we gathered feedback from our customers about how they're using our data export tool. And we found um, that they're using it for many reasons, including to download their information, to share it with their doctors, with their nutritionists, with their physical, um, um, physical therapists and, and trainers. Um, we also learned that for some of our customers, the fact that we had this data export feature was a competitive uh, differentiator for us. We had some uh, customers who purchased a Fitbit precisely because we had this data export tool. And this was important validation for us of our early decision to, um, to take consumer expectations regarding privacy into consideration when, when um, developing our products and, and deciding um, how we process um, our users' personal information. So, so to answer your question, 
Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Anybody else uh, on this or a, a different version of this? I'll, I'll pipe up. Oh, good. I think the light isn't working, um, but the mic is. Um, so at Mozilla, we have a very similar approach to developing products. We make Firefox, um, which is a browser, of always um, also known as a user agent, which means at the end of the day, we want to do what our users want us to do. And oftentimes that means protecting their privacy uh, because we live in this world where people are starting to get worried. Um, and worried users aren't good for business, for sure. Um, you know, it, it's coincidence, but I happen to have a Fitbit strapped to my arm because I trust Fitbit and I, I find the service useful. Um, and that, that means that I am open to this idea that all of this data is being you know, processed. Um, I think that you know, when we are designing Firefox and when we're designing the other Mozilla products uh, that we are thinking about, we are, we're doing user research and we're thinking about what those expectations look like. And I think from a policy perspective, we need to be doing the same thing uh, because most of these problems can't be solved either technically or with policy. It has to be a marriage of the two. Uh, and our, our top, privacy principle when we're designing products is don't surprise the users. Um, and I think that when we can translate that into policy and start building product and policy uh, broadly for Americans who don't want to be surprised but do want to use these amazing cool tools, uh, we, we start to look at the right, the right answer. So I also agree. I think that, that consumer expectations really do need to inform the policy as well. Lori, you had you want to launch it? Yeah, um, so I, I agree that consumer expectations and demands are relevant, um, but I think the question comes up as to how do we know what consumer expectations and demands actually are? And we see some companies that um, that that I think uh, probably do have a pretty good pulse on what what their users want, um, uh, but there are others that um, maybe don't. And I think part of it depends on how you frame the question, what kind of answers you get, and so. Um, I don't know that we can, you know, when, when a company says, oh, well, our, you know, our, my customers are happy to give me their data, or they, they want advertising, they want targeted advertising, um, I think you have to look with some skepticism about how are they measuring this, how are they framing the research question, and who, who collected that data. So, uh, Lori, th that's a good segue. Um, we're going to unpack a lot of that on this panel. But let's just um, take a piece of that and, and, and ask, um, I'd like to ask the question um, first of, of, of Ariel. How do consumers' um, privacy expectations and demands vary, um, in particular, across consumers? Sure, and th thank you for having me today. At Common Sense, we, we focus a lot on, on kids and teens, and I think they have very different expectations and demands than adults do, and they're an important population to look at because I think something like one in three users on the internet worldwide is under 18. And you know, parents have a lot of expectations for their kids and teens also. Parents have a lot more expectations that their children will be protected and their information protected online. Unfortunately, some of this is uh, some of this is because of COPPA, which is great, and then some of this is people don't understand COPPA and they think it prevents the collection of any information from, from children under 13 or even under 18. Um, but, but kids, they don't really have an expectation of privacy and they don't really have an understanding of privacy. They don't know that a toy that they talk to is recording them or sending their voice or information somewhere. They may view, in studies they have viewed, uh, GPS and location tracking on devices as sort of a positive, a positive thing. Um, and unlike adults who I think in this past year really woke up and started to better understand what happened with data and how things worked behind the scenes, that privacy is more than just you know, targeted ads, children are not gonna have that kind of wake up call. And so we need to, I think, work to make sure that they are protected, um, whether that is their expectation or desire or not. Um, and, and teens are also a different population. Uh, unlike children, I think teens want privacy. Everyone agrees they want privacy, and maybe we just disagree about if they want privacy more from their parents or from a <laughs> faceless company. Um, but you know, in our common sense polling, 86% of parents, 79% of teens, they've all adjusted their privacy settings. 97% uh, of parents, 93% of teens thinks it's important that sites get permission before 
sharing or selling data. I mean, the numbers are slightly higher for parents, but they're still quite high for, for teens. Um, teens express an interest in having privacy, and I think they just maybe don't know how to protect it. One number that was quite different for um, adults and teens is I think that adults were maybe, uh, or teens were twice as likely to never read privacy policies. I think that makes a lot of sense. It's very rational. If an adult doesn't understand a privacy policy, you know, good luck to the 13-year-old. So we see what their expectations are and whether they're being met by some companies or whether the teenager feels like they don't have any ability to do anything about it. They, I don't, I don't know if, I think some companies are meeting consumer demand for privacy and sometimes consumers have an expectation of privacy but they are resigned to the fact that they may not get it and we might see that a lot more with, with teenagers. So Jason, I just want to follow up. Um, Ariel's provided a good um, description of where children and parents fall on the spectrum. Um, what's the perspective of publishers with respect to um, how privacy expectation and demands may vary across um, different populations? Sure. Um, thank you for having me. And, and to reiterate, I think that's, there's some really important data points from Ariel. The, there's a myth out there that younger people don't care about privacy and it's quite quite the myth, um, so I'm glad you popped that with some, some stats. So regarding um, publishers, you know, the thing we worry most about is protecting that direct relationship that we have with our, with our audiences. Um, all of our, D, I represent DCN and all of our members, that's what they have is a direct trusted relationship with, with their users and their advertisers, their brands you know, like the New York Times and CBS, ESPN. NPR, um, and their relationship is, is built off of that meeting consumer expectations. Um, Michelle Richardson, Richardson earlier today from CDT uh, very much focused on this goal of maximizing the trust in that relationship with the user. That's what we're trying to do. And that most of the, the problems out there, particularly around consumer expectations, have to do with secondary uses of data. And that's what we see as publishers too. Um, there are certainly companies that publishers work with to deliver on the exact product that the user wants, the service that they're trying to experience. But when the data is used for other purposes, that's why purpose limitations are so important, when they're used for other purposes outside of the user's expectations, it erodes trust. We are here today, we're doing these series of hearings because there is an erosion of trust in digital right now. And it comes from some very significant things that have happened outside of consumer expectations. We have try to measure those expectations through surveys and research. Um, it's important to note that the, the two companies that collect and use data more than any companies in the advertising business, Google and Facebook, uh, they collect data on a majority of the pages on the web. Facebook collects data across over 8 million publisher sites. They've disclosed that. Google on over 70% of the top 1 million sites. Uh, we've asked users do you expect, we've done this for both companies, do you expect your data to be used for targeted advertising across the web, across multiple contexts? Two out of three users say no. They do not expect this to be happening. So that is a very significant part of the concern that is eroding trust in the marketplace. And we need to restore that value back to the publishers with the direct relationship with the user. Um, thanks. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, some of the other panelists can sort of follow up on this issue that um, Jason uh, mentioned, and, and that is how we assess or measure uh, uh, consumer expectations and uh, consumer demand. Obviously, consumers make uh, certain choices in response to offerings. We do various kinds of uh, surveys, which um, uh, may... may raise other issues, but there's both sort of what are the background expectations, what do they think the policies mean, what, what are their preferences, how, what are some of the different ways we assess the expectations and demand, more or less reliable or persuasive in different contexts? Can we get into the sort of assessment bit a little more? It seems like one. I can speak, oh, go ahead. I, go ahead. I, I was gonna say, I can speak, um, you know, I can speak to how um, companies both assess and address consumer expectations 
regarding privacy in both the context of, of children um, as well as sort of more generally uh, with, with adults. So um, you know, first, in the context of, of children, um, Ariel mentions the standards that are set out by COPPA. Um, um, in addition, companies often look to good privacy by design principles. Um, and I can, I can give another uh, Fitbit example, which is that um, we have an ACE device that is for kids. Um, our market research um, showed that uh, parents and kids um, were looking for uh, ways to encourage healthy habits um, and to, uh, to get kids to be more physically active, including through reminders to move as well as uh, uh, step competitions with friends and family. Um, our research also found that parents were uh, very concerned about how their kids' uh, personal data was being collected and used. Um, so the approach that, that um, Fitbit took um, in, in designing this device was to minimize the data that was collected and used and to focus on the essential functionality for the goal of encouraging kids to be more physically active. So, um, for example, we do not collect kids' email address, we do not collect their last name, we do not collect their GPS location information, we do not collect their personal profile photos. We use the information um, solely to provide the services. We do not use it for marketing. Um, we do not use it for third-party integrations. And in addition, we give parents control over the requests um, to friend or connect with their children on the platform. Um, the, other, the other subject I wanted to discuss to you was more uh, broadly with, um, with adults and how do we assess, um, assess privacy expectations um, in general. And I think, I think on this point, it is important to um, stress that um, privacy does not necessarily mean uh, private. Um, sometimes when we discuss privacy, this, this is the underlying assumption. And at Fitbit, we think about privacy as uh, giving people control over their information, control that we enable through product features that, um, that allows um, people to make different preferences regarding how their information is used. So the underlying assumption is not that, that people's preferences are uniform, but rather um, that they, they differ, they do vary, and our role is to um, enable people to express those different preferences. Our, um, the social features of our service reflect this, um, reflect this approach. So many of our users um, choose to share information with the Fitbit community, which is a positive feedback loop for encouraging healthy behaviors like eating well and like physical activity. Um, participating in the community is entirely optional. For those who do participate, we give granular choices around how they can share their information. So for example, some of our users choose to share their daily active, um, or their daily step count um, publicly, with, um, publicly through Twitter. We have other users who share that information with a more limited audience, with just their Fitbit friends, and we have other users who choose to share other information, like the graphs of their uh, weight and and sleep over time. So while some, uh, of so our I'm sorry, Laura, this this is important, I think, and we we want to hear uh, okay, let me, let more me about it. But if, if you could line. wrap up, and I'd like to hear from some other panelists too. Yeah, have... yeah. So I mean, the the bottom line is that um, is that we um, address our customers' privacy preferences by. Um, by giving them choice and by control, by giving them control through um, sensible defaults, where um, almost all information is defaulted to private, um, and then we have granular choices so that people can choose to share the information that they want, while others can um, decide to keep it private. Thanks. 
Thanks. Avi? So, Dan, I think you, you asked originally about measurement. Like how do we think about measuring preferences? And um, in some sense, measuring privacy preferences isn't different from measuring other kinds of preferences. Just like Laura, you know, she opened with privacy is an attribute and there are other attributes. And so broadly speaking, um, uh, in, in economics at least, when we think about measuring preferences, we think about two different strategies. The first one is you can ask people what their preferences are. And if you ask people what their preferences are, they tend to like things that sound good, like privacy and like openness. Um, and on the same topic, you could ask the same question, hey, do you think privacy here is good? They'll say yes. Do you think openness here is good? They'll say yes, even though in some sense, those can be the opposites. Um, the other way to measure is through revealed preference, which is where you observe what people actually do, particularly in the context of real trade-offs. And generally, that tends to be much more powerful. So the question is, when people are informed, that's an important caveat, when people are informed um, and they continue to use the services of a company, even though there's been very public privacy violations, does that tell you something about their underlying preferences for privacy relative to the other attributes uh, that, uh, that that service provides? So could I? Mm -hmm. So I, just briefly, I guess, um, I think it's a really important caveat if people are informed and then also if they choose to use a service, because I think in a lot of contexts, particularly let's talk about children again and teens and they're in school, you have to use certain services to get an education or you have to use certain services for your work. Um, I know people are trying to see, you know, how long they can avoid Google. You know, I couldn't have my job and not, and not use Gmail. So I, in a lot of these instances, I don't know that we can really see both information and a choice by con consumers. I also just really quickly with respect to uh, teens and what, what they do and what they might say they want and then what they persist in doing, you know, their brains are still developing. Their prefrontal cortex is not developing. They're very uh, risky. They're, you know, more likely to have some sort of fatal accident. Not, so it's not just, you know, risky in terms of privacy behavior. They're very reward sensitive. They want whatever quick thing they're going to get now. And so they're going to share information or click on that right blinking button and not think about the long-term consequences down the road, which they might not be able to fully understand and likely can't understand or even imagine what they are. And so I don't, you know, they're going to self-reveal before they self-reflect. And so I, they're sort of making a choice in that instance. I thought Professor Rome did a good job talking about if it was a real choice in this question of dark patterns. Um, but. I don't know that I put a, a lot of stock in what they might be doing online and whether they really have choices. Can I just put a slightly finer point on it? And Lori, I'd like to ask you this question first. Um, at, the, at the outset of today's session, um, there, w there was a robust discussion about the so-called privacy paradox, um, and there's been a lot of literature about this, and, um, and Avi, you, you, you talked, uh, you alluded to it um, just now in your remarks. Um, so I guess what, I, what I'd like to, to, to throw to the panel and to Lori first is, is, is whether there exists a privacy paradox. Is that the right way to frame it? And, 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 and what does that mean for assessing um, uh, consumer demand and expectations for privacy? Yeah, so I, I agree with the panelists this morning who, who said that there, there probably isn't really a privacy paradox, um, that uh, you know, we see behavior that on the surface appears contradictory, um, but, uh, but when you dig deeper into it, uh, you can see that, that people are making uh, decisions, but it's not based on full information. Um, and uh, they may not have a robust uh, set of choices that, that they can decide between. Um, so I, I actually did research uh, at this point about 10 years ago with Alessandro Acquisti and some of our students uh, where we said, well, what if we could really show people in a very easy way what their privacy choices are when they're shopping online? And so we built a search engine that had a privacy meter in the search results. Results. And so you could see at a glance. And we gave people money, and we asked them to go shopping online, and they got to keep the change. Um, and we set it up so that they could uh, shop at the more expensive website uh, to have better privacy, or shop at the cheaper website, get the exact um, same same item, uh, but with worse privacy. And, and we found that when you set it up so it's so obvious which is better and which is worse, people actually will pay a little bit more 
to shop at the site with better privacy. Um, but all you have to do is move those meters into the web page itself instead of in the search engine and the effect goes away. So that, that little bit of extra burden of having to go and find out about privacy is too much. So, so what, what's the response there, right? We prefer revealed preference, all things equal. As Avi pointed out, information is limited, uh, imperfect, choices are limited, and not to imply that we ought to be sanguine about these limitations, but you know, in some ways decision under uncertainty is ubiquitous. The market may provide a few choices or many choices, but not <laughs> infinitely many choices. What, what do we do? I, I thought you raised an interesting point in contrasting you know, two models of the experiment. One was uh, <laughs> the search engine and the other w was the web page. What do we do uh, to get a, a sense of what really matters to consumers given these limitations? Yeah, so I, I think you know, revealed preferences definitely gives you um, a, a lot of good information, but you have to realize the whole context. You know, this, this is very contextual, and um, and just because uh, a particular company does something and you don't see their their customers fleeing doesn't mean that their customers were happy with what the company did. Um, I think you have to look at the whole thing, and I think the research needs to be a combination of these natural experiments that occur as well as <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, some some uh, explicit ex uh, lab experiments or online experiments where you can control the conditions and see which are the factors that are driving things. Okay. So uh, first, I want to say that Laurie and Alessandro's study is, you know, in some sense, exactly where we where we like to be in the sense that it was revealed preference and um, and it showed a preference for privacy under one situation, not the other. It, um, at least from my reading of the paper, it's not obvious which was the right one. Uh, but but that difference is interesting. Um, but I, I do think circling back, um, it's it's remember it's important to remember that, that privacy is one attribute among many. And uh, one thing that we need to think about very carefully is how much we want to elevate that attribute above the others versus not. Um, and related to that, it's important to remember that privacy um, is a beneficial attribute. But it's a like other attributes when you're designing a product, you have these trade-offs in the sense that um, search engines tend to be more useful uh, when they can take advantage of data. And social media platforms tend to be more useful if data gets shared uh, within the platform. So that's, you know, there's, there's certainly places where the, um, where the costs of privacy are uh, relatively high compared to what the consumer benefit would be. And I think that's what you know, everyone else has been talking about. But I think it's really important to recognize uh, there are trade-offs here. The data is useful. And so in, you know, in product design with or without regulation, um, those trade-offs should be um, at the forefront. I would, OK. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, um, uh, sh should we um, move along? I think um, um, this is very good. And I hope panelists will follow up with us after. I know you all have a lot of work on this. I, I don't mean to um, shortchange anybody. Um, so I, I guess we've got twin questions about practices that do and don't meet consumer expectations to the extent we know them. One, um, do practices that fail to meet consumer expectations either necessarily or typically lead to consumer harm? Um, and maybe we'll, then we're going to want to ask uh, whether, to what extent, and when uh, firms are responsive to consumer demand for privacy. So maybe with the first one we we could start with Ariel, but then open it up to the panel. Sure, I think that if consumers are, and let's, well, I guess, we'll take out really small children who, um, who I don't think you know know that they don't have an expectation of privacy, and so meeting that, I don't know that that's a great thing. But in general, I think if a consumer is surprised or confused didn't expect what was going to happen to happen, that that's a, that's a bad thing. Um, I do feel that there are also times when a consumer has expectations that they have no control, and that expectation is met, and that can also be a bad thing. So it's not just when consumer expectations aren't met that there's harm. But if, if they wouldn't have done what they did, had they known what you would do with their information or their data, 
that seems like a harm to me. We can see, how, how about the question about consumer demand? I think maybe uh, Avi, Jason, Laura, any, any thoughts on uh, how or to what extent um, firms are responding to consumer demand? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to speak to consumer um, demand. Um, and my points are um, actually very relevant to, um, to Lori's point about the relevance of privacy at the point of making a selection um, about which products to use, as well as um, to Avi's point that um, that you know privacy is one is is a you know is, a, is one consideration that that customers can consider amongst many, um, and so um, on the on the purchasing point, I will say that um, one way that Fitbit has been responsive um, to consumer demand. Um, is in how we market our devices. We understand that the data that our devices collect um, and the functionality that they provide is a, uh, is a relevant, are relevant considerations at the time of purchase. So our website um, provides um, information about the different devices that they, uh, the devices that we have um, the different um, data types that they collect and the different functionality that they provide. So this ranges from you know, ba basic step count sleep tracking to more sophisticated features like, like heart rate um, and GPS tracking. And um, consumers may choose to, have, to purchase a device that has more limited um, data collection. Um, however, this means that um, there may be a a trade-off in that there is also more limited functionality. So our devices that um, do not um, collect heart rate data or GPS data don't have certain, um, don't um, enable certain features like the heart rate information in the dashboard or the exercise and run maps that are based on GPS data. Um, um, also, some of their metrics may be less accurate, like the distance that they traveled, their calories that they burned, um, their sleep stages. So there are, um, these are important factors in the purchasing decision, and there are definitely um, differences in the product experience that come from these um, considerations. And the approach that we've taken at Fitbit is to be transparent about this and to um, empower our customers to decide what is the right trade-off from them um, based on the product comparison information at the point of purchase. Thanks. Jason, I know you've been trying to get in uh, the last question. I don't know if you <laughs> have uh, sure. um I'll just I'll keep it simple. That in, um, I think that the are the demands being met? No, and expectations are going down to what I think Ariel said is is a problem, and so um, that's not a good thing. When expectations are going down, you want them to go up, um, and there is an intersection that we'll get into around competition. That's a very large discussion right now across our industry. That's really important. Um, you know, Avi said search engines, um, plural, which I always find a bit um, amusing. So, so th there is not the same sort of choice we should have, and so we are forced into certain products. You know, to in a world where there's really good competition around certain types of experiences, for instance, maps. Um, certainly, if you put your data, or Google Maps is using your data uh, for the purpose of delivering directions, you would expect that and you would appreciate that and that's a fine that's a fine product experience. It's when the data is again used for a secondary purpose which you wouldn't expect and you don't really have control over that it becomes problematic. Um, most of our 80 or so premium publisher members do things with data as part of the experience that most consumers fully expect and if they violate that, they'll go somewhere else. They have that choice. The New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, certainly I think most people want them to recognize you when you come in as a subscriber so that you can actually immediately consume the news and not have to log in every time. But if they violate that data relationship, then you will go somewhere else because there's real competition in the news category for sure. And there's you know, certainly competition in the entertainment category. And so for each of those cases, the, what you do with the data as a, as a direct consumer experience has to align to with preserving and maximizing that relationship. If it's used for other purposes, which you don't expect, then it becomes problematic. And big behemoth companies that are all intertwined in our lives don't have those same sort of restrictions. Uh, Avi, you were trying to... Okay, so um, 
I'm <coughs> listening here. I'm, I'm trying to figure out where the think through where the market failure is, in the sense that um, you know, yes, consumer negative surprises. That that's bad for sure. That's bad for firms. That's bad for consumers. Uh, but we have some sense that firms do respond. We just you know, heard how Fitbit thinks about these, and, and lots of other companies, I'm sure if they were up here, would say the same thing. And so the question is, um, why aren't, you know, there's some sense, at least on others in the panel, that they're not responding enough. And the question is, why aren't they responding enough? Is that, does that have to do with privacy policy per se? Or, you know, Jason seemed to be hinting, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, that it was more about antitrust policy than privacy policy, in the sense that there wasn't choice, and it's not a, you know, if, if there's choice, if there's lots of competition, then we're not so worried about privacy because you can go elsewhere and we can think about revealed preference. Um, but if there's no choice, then privacy becomes more important. So the, um, this um, you know, thinking through you know, where the market failure is, given that privacy is one attribute of, on many, um, I think is very important. I totally agree. I, I just want to lock in on one point there. Um, it is the intersection of data policy and competition that we think is critical. And I think Facebook as a company, to, to outline this, and there's a great uh, research paper that was put out on this, is a, is a great case study on a company that led with privacy for its first five or six years as a company. Uh, you couldn't even use the product unless um, you were doing it in an experience that was very privacy protected. The executives all talked about privacy as the most important thing to the product. Once it got to a certain size, uh, and certain uh, public expectations when it went public, it started to lower the, lower the bar on a lot of its decisions and the quality of the product then went down, but it was okay because they were a certain size and we've seen what's happened now over the last few years. Maybe Lori and then we should move on. So I, I think there are many products where it's actually really difficult to even find out the choices. Uh, we're doing some research right now on IoT devices, and consumers are telling us that they have no idea how to figure out what data their IoT devices are collecting. Um, and we've seen recently that there have been cases where uh, I think it was a thermostat that was, it was suddenly revealed had a microphone in it. Who would have thought their thermostat had a microphone? And once you've bought it and put it on your wall, it's actually not that easy to go buy another one, take it down, and replace it. So um, I think that there are many cases where consumers don't really have real privacy choice. OK, so um, to, to just segue, um, let's talk for a moment about the incentives then for firms to respond um, to providing privacy, the thermostat or otherwise, um, and and uh, moving out of the thermostat uh, market for just a moment, um, Heather, um, let, let me let me throw a softball your way and ask you how browsers respond to consumers' um, expectations and demands with respect to privacy. Uh, sure, yeah, that is a softball. I can talk about this one all day, but I'll try not to. Okay. Um, so, so when as as we move into this world that is ever connected, and as people understand some of the the data flows that are involved when they're uh, you know working online, you know watching TV, streaming services, all of these all of these things that we don't necessarily think of as um, sending data off to third parties. Um, you know, we decided as the user agent we needed to figure out what our users wanted to do. Um, and so we did a, a bunch of research, um, and if you want to search for that, it's called Improving Privacy Without Breaking the Web. And it goes through our entire research process. What do people actually want? What are some of the balancing factors that, you know, that they are interested in? Does this actually break things? Um, and so we started to build the tools that we saw demand for in that market. And some of those tools are enhanced tracking protection, and we work with partners to make sure that 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 doesn't you know break unintended uh, pieces of the web. No, no one's asking for that. Um, but also to create a gradient or a spectrum of tools for our users, so that if you if you legitimately want to break everything that's not a first party on a page, you can do that. I want you to understand what that means. So we tried to make the preferences clear. That's a hard problem. Um, but we made some other guesses about what kinds of preferences we ought to be um, creating tools around. Um, and in the last year, we also created something called Facebook Container, which I think is actually a really interesting use case. And what it does is it divorces your interactions on Facebook as a first party with your interactions on pages that have Facebook as a third party. Um, 
because what we heard from our users is they were surprised that Firefox, their browser, who is trying to protect them online, uh, was, was facilitating those data flows. Um, and that's more of a little bit of an experiment to see how, how that works and how, um, you know, whether people like it. People seem to like it. Um, but those are the kinds of tools that we have been building and thinking about. And so we're actually looking for people to, to give us some ideas because we want to build those tools. Um, and, and Jason, similarly, how do, how do publishers balance expectations and demands with the need to obtain metrics on, uh, on their audience and, and otherwise? Uh, I, you know, I think that's, uh, metrics is a perfect example where you know, they do align with consumer expectations and, and the best thing we could do as an industry is you know, if a user is going into a publisher's site and they're trying just to keep track of how many people are on their site for the purpose of, of measurement, that we don't create friction around that because that's fairly in line with, with first party expectations. Um, there's other things like fraud prevention that would also, billing that would also fit in that category. Personalization, if you go into a sports site, it knows who your favorite sports teams are if you tell it, things like that. Um, again, it's about the, the secondary uses. Uh, the word tracking was used by, by Heather, which you know, I think Mozilla and Apple are both doing brilliant work and thoughtful work to try to delineate between these two uh, experiences um, so that they don't break things, but at the same time, uh, give the consumer more of, of what they expect. So I like to see more positive work there. I think the only, the only challenge to publishers that, that is nuanced but is important to understand is that a, uh, Apple Safari experience or a Mozilla Firefox experience or any experience with tracking prevention could be better for the user because that advertising still has to compete with ads that are delivered in a world of relentless, ubiquitous tracking. Um, often the, the, the ads that have all the data uh, that can be coupled with the ads um, in those on the open web, with kind of this unbridled ability to collect data and target, um, those ads end up becoming more valuable because there's just more data layered on. That's, that's only because of the way the market is currently designed. If we raise the bar across the entire industry equally, then we will solve for that issue so we can have an experience like what Mozilla and Apple are envisioning that's even better for the, for the user, and that's the tricky part and, and why the work being done here is really important. Thanks. So, um, you know, several of you have mentioned competitive dynamics, but also uh, Avi mentioned and then several people followed up with um, the idea of um, uh, trade-offs there, um, you know, non-price factors of a good or service may be many, even privacy itself, and privacy pertinent features may be many and complex. Um, so I wonder, maybe starting with Avi, Avi but then also uh, others, Laura, Ariel, um, want to know about some of these trade-offs and whether to what extent firms incur opportunity costs as a result of increased investments in privacy tools, I mean, whether we're talking about functionality, accessibility, um, ease of use, uh, uh, innovation, uh, security, et cetera. What, how, do, how does some of this get teased out? Um, so at a high level, it should come as no surprise that data is useful. The, the reason companies are trying to collect data is not because they're trying to violate privacy per se, typically. Um, it's instead that the data that they have is useful to the, that they could collect about uh, consumers and others is useful to the company. And so um, restrictions, regulatory restrictions in particular, on, on information flows are going to restrict the ability of firms to do that. That said, um, you know, to the extent that consumers are demanding it, um, that actually, you know, that goes in the other direction because if consumers trust firms more, then they're going to be willing to give those companies uh, potentially more useful data or just generally be their customers, which is uh, what the firm's trying to achieve in the first place. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I would, I would just add that, uh, just to reiterate, I think that the cost from privacy uh, rules can be when friction's introduced to the user, um, when things are aligned with their expectations already. And so if you're going to a, a website or an app, uh, and lots of people like to talk about the, the cookie banners in Europe as if that's some new GDPR thing, but it's not. It's from actually from pre-GDPR. 
and the intention is to make those go away when, when they're not necessary. If a user's going into a, a website and they're being hit with notices uh, as part of that experience and that experience aligns with their expectations, then it's just, it's just adding friction and a cost. And so um, I think that's actually where the California uh, law, and I know you had Alistair Mattaggart earlier today, uh, where it's been, where it was really smart, is it's, it's, it hasn't gotten in the way of, of using the actual websites as you would uh, want to use them. And it hasn't gotten in the way of even behavioral advertising inside the context of the website. It's, it's preventing the ability to do secondary uses of data when the user doesn't want that. And that's smart. Um, yeah, I just add that um, you know, there absolutely are trade-offs between um, functionality and innovation on the one hand and privacy and security on the other hand. The, um, you know, the example that I gave of um, the devices, the Fitbit devices that we offer that collect more data just have more uh, functionality and accuracy is, is one place where you see those, those kinds of trade-offs. But you see it also outside of the product context, um, just in terms of you know, how data can be used uh, more generally for, um, for you know, even social good purposes. So for example, in the context of health research, um, um, break, breakthroughs in health research often come from amassing large data sets of very personal and sensitive information um, from multiple data sources. Um, so, you know, you know, obviously there are significant privacy considerations here. Um, at the same time, there are social good considerations, you know, that countervail. Um, and, um, you know, the privacy protections that get put in place or that tend to get put in place to protect individuals, for example, getting individual consent as well as aggregating or de-identifying data sets, you know, do mean that um, there are restrictions on those research data sets and inevitably some useful data um, is removed from those data sets, some useful data that could have been used for a social good. And as in the product context, um, in the research context, I think it's all about striking the right balance between privacy and um, the innovation that can come and the insights that can come from data. And the one point that I would stress too is that in the research context, there are multiple players. They're usually um, um, multiple parties like you know, academic institutions, research organizations, government, and privacy industry. And so it's not just about any one um, organization striking the right balance, but having um, some consensus across the ecosystem about what that right balance is. And I think I might just say that while I, certainly, I agree there are definitely sort of social good uses of data, and it's not all about the individual, I think if we're remiss in not mentioning that, I think the flip side is also true. Um, that there are negative externalities in terms of data being collected. What might not be a big deal for one person suddenly could be very problematic if we're talking about a community or a country. And so it sort of works both ways. Mm -hmm. So um, we're near the end of our panel, and we've received a terrific question from the audience um, that is a, is a good segue to the next couple of panels, which will address in different ways um, public policy questions about sort of where we go from here. Um, so I, I, Dan and I would like to pose to this group um, uh, a question that marries or that, 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 that provides a good bridge between the, the issue of consumer demand and expectations for privacy with the larger public policy question of, of sort of what's next. Um, and the question is this, um, whether it would, um, well, what you would think of Congress passing a law that would require heightened protection for data collection and use that does not meet consumer expectations. Um, is that a workable solution? Um, is it good public policy? I think it's a, a very interesting way to frame it, but I, I, you know, Mozilla supports the passage of legislation. Uh, we published a blueprint for what we think that should look like, and it does have a lot to do with uh, consumer expectations and purpose specification that Jason's been talking about is also a big piece of that to talk about, okay, so I gave you my phone number, but here's how I expected you to use it. And I do think that that's a good start to the discussion around uh, what, how to translate these consumer expectations and desires and preferences into uh, legislation or regulation. Anyone else? I would just, uh, you know, yes, it's a good start, and I think I would then ultimately we 
recommend translating that into using context as an important way to, to measure um, consumer expectations uh, as much as anything and putting purpose limitations around that so that way um, it can be enforced in a way that's material. And I guess, you know, are we talking about expectation? Are we talking about demand and desire? I'm concerned. I, well, I, I agree it's a good start, too. I think I don't just want to meet consumers currently probably pretty low expectations. That's a good point. That's right. uh, may I? So, um, so I also think it's an intriguing um, idea. There's sort of two challenges I can think of. One is not all consumers have the same expectations. So heterogeneous expectations are going to be a first order mm -hmm. challenge. And two, as with anything, uh, you got to make sure that the regulatory burden isn't high enough so that only the big companies can compete and comply at scale. And so in, you know, however you design thinking about what expectations are, um, the expectations of, you know, you have to make sure that startups and large established companies can still uh, compete. Yeah, I, I actually don't think that makes a whole lot of sense. Um, I, I think that it, it's it's too difficult to, you know, as we've discussed here, it's too difficult to, to know exactly what the expectations are and what exactly that even means. And um, I, I think that there are some principles that I'd like to see in a law. I, I think we want to not surprise consumers, which means we have to communicate with them about what's going on so that they understand what's happening. Um, and I think we should give them choices about the secondary uses of their data. I think that's a much better framing than to say we're just going to meet their expectations. Yeah. I, th I think when reframing um, expectations as both transparency and control, that that is um, a positive way to address a lot of the um, varying expectations that we've discussed here on the panel. So we have many more questions, but with three minutes left, and people have far more of interest to say than, than I do. Um, may I just ask if we can go down the line and confine yourself to 30 seconds. There's a clock right there. Uh, is there, uh, in this space that we've talked about today, is there a point we're missing, a question we're failing to ask, or uh, something you'd like to leave us with? Just, we'll, we'll just start at the end, Heather. Okay, I think that we've touched on this um, a little bit, but I want to just say it explicitly. People are complicated, and the idea that I am worried about a service but also find it very useful isn't a paradox. They can be both 100% true at the same time. And so as, as we reframe the way that we think about privacy preferences, not to say that those binary choices aren't important to look at, um, but looking at you know integrating that into the context of how we understand how to build the internet and the technology sector and all of these products and services that we know and love, but we can do it better. Great. Yeah. Laura? Um, I, I mean, just, you know, I think to, to follow up on that, I mean, the, you know, the, the U.S. approach has, um, you know, very much historically always looked at, um, you know, balancing considerations around um, protecting consumers as well as enabling uh, the benefits of innovation. And so, uh, you know, I think that in order to continue that, that um, sensible tradition that, that looking at ways that, you know, technology can put the user in the driver's seat um, is, is um, incredibly important as we um, sort of evolve our, our, our privacy policy and approaches. Thanks. Jason? I would just add from the, from the publisher sector that um, there is an urgency to this and that uh, there is a, unfortunately, a first mover kind of disadvantage right now that any, in the advertising sector, anybody who tries to lead with privacy and mean consumer expectations actually just gets hit negatively with, with revenue. And so uh, there is enormous power that is moving towards and has moved over the last 10 years to a very few number of companies for much of the advertising sector. And that is squeezing the oxygen out of the companies that are actually creating the news and the entertainment that have historically been uh, responsible for the trust of the, the public. And it's having societal implications now. Um, that's why we're here and talking about it. And so. Um, we need to raise the bar quickly and smartly across the industry. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Laura? I'm sorry, uh, Ariel. Um, just to reiterate that it's critical that everyone thinks about children and teens when designing services. Um, they're probably using yours, even if you are, quote, a general audience site or service, um, and they both require special protections uh, for different reasons. 
in terms of understanding privacy and understanding how to how to protect themselves. Great, Javi. Um, so at a high level, given given the usefulness of data, um, at the same time consumers' concerns about privacy, I think there's a big question of where's the market failure here. We've we've heard sort of hypotheses around it's about dominance or it's about obfuscation that you're not getting the information. Um, an alternative possibility is um, that. Uh, you know, often the market is working. And so thinking through where the real market failure is is, is sort of core to any regulation. Right. And Lori? I, I think we have to make it really easy for consumers to be able to understand what's going on and exercise their choices. And you know, the set and forget approach is, is a nice, easy approach. And I know it gets a lot of resistance. But I think we need to find, the, find ways of, of meeting consumer expectations by making it easy for them and to collect data to actually validate that these things work. All right, well, please join Dan and me in thanking our panel um, for their contributions this afternoon. Thank you. Put the academics together. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, um, and thank you for joining us. We are um, continuing our session this afternoon with um, our panel on the current approaches to privacy. I'm Laura Van Druff. I'm an attorney in the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection, and I'm joined by my colleague, Jared Ho, 
Um, and uh, let me introduce very briefly our panelists. They're full and impressive biographies are in your materials as well as online. Um, but um, very quickly, um, to my left is Margot Kaminsky, um, and I'm excited that she has a short presentation for us after I um, quickly introduce the balance of our panel. Um, to Margot's left is um, Fred Kate. Um, I'm sorry, and Margot, excuse me, Margot, <laughs> is an associate professor at the University of Colorado um, Law School, and she's the director of the Privacy Initiative at um, the uh, Silicon Flatirons. Uh, again, uh, to Margo's left is Fred Kate, who is the Vice President for Research and a distinguished professor um, at, of law at Indiana University. Um, to Fred's left is Marcus Heider, who is the Vice President and Senior Policy Counselor um, at Hunton and Win at, at Hunton, excuse me, always Hunton and Williams, <laughs> to me, but it's Hunton Andrews Kurth uh, at the Center for um, Information Policy Leadership. Uh, to Marcus's left is David LeDuc. And he is the Vice President um, of Public Policy for the Network Advertising Initiative. Uh, to David's left is Laura Moy. She's the Executive Director, Director of Georgetown Law's Center on Privacy and Technology. And finally, um, uh, to Laura's left is Chandra Watson, Senior Director of Policy at um, BSA, the Software Alliance, where she provides counsel and develops global policy. Um, so without further ado, um, let me introduce um, Margot Kaminsky, who is going to provide a brief overview comparing privacy laws. Thank you. Thank you, Margo. So I have the great pleasure of introducing a number of privacy experts to comparative privacy law, um, which I hope will not be redundant with what you already know, but maybe provide a little bit more of a theoretical framework for how to think about comparisons between US law, um, European data protection law, and currently proposed state approaches, which you've heard about throughout the day. So I'm gonna start with an overview of US federal laws. I'm going to then go to the General Data Protection Regulation, the EU's data protection law. Um, and then I'll talk very briefly about proposed uh, and recently enacted state laws. And all of this in five to 10 minutes. Thank you for the laughter. Um, so the basic framework for comparisons here, I have gotten from uh, University of Minnesota professor Bill McGeverin. Um, and he describes the, the framework of types of data privacy laws on a spectrum from consumer protection to data protection with hybrid models in between. The consumer protection model, which we're all very familiar with sitting here at an FTC hearing, is the idea of regulating the relationship between a consumer and the business to whom they give their data. This focuses largely on the direct uh, rep representations of the business to consumer uh, and direct rights that the consumer has with regard to that particular business. What it does less well, as you all know, is reach the behavior of third parties like data brokers. Um, the data protection model, by contrast, follows the data. So there are a series of individual rights, which I'll get into in greater depth shortly, and company obligations, which track the personal data itself, rather than focusing directly only on the relationship between the consumer and the business. And many models out there, even within the United States, are hybrid models somewhere between the points of the spectrum. So additional points of comparison you'll hear in my remaining eight minutes. One, obviously there's a difference between omnibus data protection law and sectoral data protection law, so data or data privacy law. Uh, data privacy law that focuses on a particular sector, particular type of business, or particular type of information, versus data privacy law that is supposed to follow all kinds of personal data in all sectors. We have the contrast between a notice and choice model, which often is employed in some way in the consumer protection model and sometimes within a data protection model as well, versus sort of augmentations to notice and choice that focus more on, for example, company obligations or duties, even in the absence of individual invocation of rights. And that goes to a contrast between an individual rights regime that gives individuals notice rights, access rights, control over data, versus a compliance regime that focuses more on appointing data protection officers or having data protection impact assessments, and not just the duties that companies owe to individuals, but their management and risk assessment regimes for data running through their companies. 
There is a contrast, this is much higher level, but between hard law and soft law, um, both rules versus standards and different kinds of compliance. So you can write a law that is extremely specific ex ante in its requirements, or a law more like the GDPR that is extremely vague ex ante in its requirements and gets constituted through back and forth between uh, companies and the regulators. So I'm starting with current federal law, the first of which I should be able to spend just a very short amount of time with. The Federal Trade Commission, again, very familiar to all of you here, um, is largely in McGovern's scheme a consumer protection model. Uh, it is omnibus-ish in the sense that there are clear exceptions from it, including for nonprofits, um, including gaps in coverage of third parties, uh, but compared to US sectoral laws, including some that the FTC enforces, it's more omnibus than other regimes. Then we have our federal sectoral statutes, again, which I'm sure we'll talk about at greater length during this panel, HIPAA, COPPA, the gramm leach bliley Act, all of which target either specific entities or specific types of information or combinations of both. These have data protection-like features. So sometimes there are rules that follow the data as opposed to rules that just focus on the direct relationship between a consumer and a company, but they're not data protection-like in the comprehensive way that, say, the GDPR is. And they largely still, even within that data protection-like framework, do focus heavily, as a matter of historic accident, if not policy choice, on the idea of individual notice and choice. So even in a data protection framework, they're more on the notice and choice than on the compliance governance side of that regime. We can debate that later if needed. Uh, the GDPR, wow, that's small font. Um, the GDPR, on a very high level, um, differs in a number of ways from US regimes, as you all know. First, it is absolutely an omnibus type of regulation. I'm gonna largely talk about it as it applies to companies, um, because that's the impact for individuals in the United States, um, or companies in the United States. But it's omnibus in the sense that it follows all personal data and all processing of personal data, with exceptions for personal household use, for the context of criminal law, uh, and the context of national security, among other things. The definition of personal data is extremely broad, rivaled probably only by the definition of personal data in the California Consumer Protection Act. The GDPR represents the data protection model par excellence. Right? The laws follow the data. Um, they very clearly apply to third parties that hold data they did not obtain originally from an individual with whom they had a consumer relationship. Um, and that includes uh, especially coverage of third parties. Uh, in fact, arguably, the GDPR puts more onerous requirements on third-party data brokers than it does even on the companies that have direct business relationships with consumers. It's hard law along some lines. Um, there are, again, famously significant fines that attach um, if regulators decide to use them in enforcement. Uh, and there are both individual rights of enforcement, regulatory enforcement, uh, and serious court involvement. And this is combined, the system of hard law is combined in the GDPR with softer law, um, which ranges from just the inclusion of broad standards that will eventually get fleshed out through back and forth between uh, companies and regulators. And uh, in addition to those broad standards, specific formal mechanisms of collaborative governance contemplated, like codes of conduct uh, or certification mechanisms. So the core elements of what's in the GDPR, and here I'll go a little bit faster. We have a system of individual rights. This is what most US persons think of when they think of the GDPR. They think of the rights of notice, the subject access rights, uh, the right to deletion famously you know, uh, described as the right to be forgotten. And on the other side, less noticed by US persons usually uh, are the obligations for companies, but very noticed obviously by companies. The individual rights are FIPS-like. They're fair information practice principles-like. Um, they include notice rights, access rights, a correction right, erasure, famously data portability, also famously a right to contest algorithmic, solely automated algorithmic decisions. And then the obligations for companies, which form what I would argue the, is the bulk of the GDPR's impact, um, stem from this idea, this core principle from the GDPR of accountability. So this is the idea that companies not only need to institute complex internal compliance regimes, but they need to be accountable throughout internally and if regulators choose to ask for it um, and for some mandatory reporting requirements directly to the regulators. 
So this means that companies looking at the GDPR have to be thinking very strategically uh, and in depth about not just filling the checklist of compliance, but being able to demonstrate their compliance with the GDPR. The second element of the GDPR um, that is uh, really notable, especially when contrasted with US laws, is this core principle of lawfulness. So processing must be lawful. Um, this is not something that you really see in even US data protection-like laws. When a data controller, meaning the company that determines the means, uh, purposes, et cetera, of processing of data, processes personal data, it has to have a legitimate ground for processing. And a number of US persons looking at the GDPR in passing may confuse this with the notice and choice regime and think that legitimate grounds for processing just means you have to get somebody's consent. In practice, uh, as many of you know, again, Companies often avoid consent because consent can be withdrawn under the, under the GDPR and instead choose other legitimate grounds for processing. Obligations also include all of the above, transparency requirements, affirmative notice requirements, not just when individuals ask for access, uh, but affirmatively to individuals who haven't yet asked. Uh, documentation recording requirements, security obligations, the requirement in some circumstances, high-risk circumstances, that you appoint a data protection officer, conduct impact assessments, um, and the uh, famous slash infamous requirement of data protection by design and by default, um, which again is largely a designing corporate governance, internal corporate governance mechanisms type of requirement. So overview summary of the GDPR. It, the GDPR is a hard law data protection regime in that it's backed by significant enforcement capabilities and multiple prongs of enforcement, not just from regulators, but also by individuals. But it has significant soft law and collaborative features within it. And these requirements focus on both individual rights and significantly, possibly more significantly worldwide, company compliance. All right, so in my remaining few seconds, um, by comparison, the California Consumer Privacy Act, which you've heard about a lot throughout the day, um, it is somewhere between consumer protection and data protection. So there are elements of it that focus primarily on the relationship between a consumer and the business that gathers consumer data directly from the consumer. And there are other elements of it that do actually follow the data, um, which is different from most US existing privacy regimes. It's omnibus, but it's only omnibus-ish uh, in that it focuses on businesses, with the definition of business being a subset of three different kinds of businesses. Um, the definition of personal information, however, is broad, extremely broad, and possibly, arguably, broader than the definitions within the GDPR. The California Consumer Protection Act contains, again, notice and access rights, um, which are similar to the GDPR, but in their granular details differ in ways that could raise regulatory costs for companies. It has a limited deletion right, emphasis on limited, um, in that the deletion right attaches more to the consumer protection relationship or consumer protection review of privacy um, than to third parties. It has a limited opt-out right, again, of sale of data, but not in other contexts. Uh, and its enforcement mechanisms are very different from the GDPR. There's no individual right of action. It's enforceable largely by the state attorney general, except in a specific data security context. Uh, and that state attorney general is also the regulator responsible for promulgating rules that clarify some of the obligations under the law. So in short, they overlap pretty significantly, the CCPA and the GDPR, when you're talking about the parts that deal with transparency and individual control, the aspects of data protection that look most like, say, open government laws in the United States. But they diverge really significantly on what I've called the most important part of the GDPR, which is the compliance or comp company obligations. There's nothing in the CCPA that includes anything on legal basis of processing. There's somewhat a light purpose specification requirement in the disclosure requirements. Um, there's no use limitation. There's no data minimization. There's no DPA uh, require or DPO requirement. There's no DPIA requirement, et cetera. And they have vastly differing enforcement mechanisms with a private right of action in the GDPR that allows individuals in Europe to invoke the uh, pro-data protection um, in inclinations of European courts. Um, and they have vastly differing court contexts to that point exactly. Okay. So I'll close here. The proposed state laws that we've seen around the country, and we've seen probably almost all of these states impose something that they call or propose something that they call data privacy laws in the last year. 
Um, they largely, to the extent that they are data privacy and not just data security under the guise or name of data privacy, as my home state of Colorado has, um, to the extent that they are data privacy laws, they're largely directly mimicking the CCPA and not mimicking the GDPR. Um, they evidence, nonetheless, a significant paradigm shift in US data privacy laws because there's this shift from the sectoral mode to the omnibus, again, omnibus-ish mode. Um, and there's a shift towards data protection of protections that follow the data away from just the consumer protection model that we're used to in this context. Various variations we've seen, some of the proposed laws not enacted yet, but some of the proposed laws add a private right of action. Some establish exploratory committees rather than actually establishing law. Um, and many focus on data security even though they are proposed under the moniker of data protection or data privacy. So with that, I will turn over to my fellow panelists. Thank you very much for your time. OK, so that was tremendous. <laughs> I, I learned everything I needed to know. Um, no, in all seriousness, um, that was a, a very quick overview, but really very substantive. Um, but I wanted to just open it to the panel at the outset to see um, if anyone had any high-level comments on the differences in approach that you see between the GDPR, CCPA, and the US um, sectoral-specific approach and self-regulation. And if not, then um, I, I, I can move on to, to a different question. I mean, I think that, so Margo did a great job. Thank you so much for that summary, Margo. That was fantastic and really helpful. Um, Margo did a pretty good job highlighting some of the high level differences of them, um, the, the, the sort of vast comprehensiveness of GDPR, um, the much more limited in scope uh, nature of CCPA, uh, and of course the sectoral laws. I think I would highlight a couple differences. So one, um, one is the enforcement of GDPR. So something that GDPR does that, uh, that, is, that is kind of new and, um, and likely will make a big difference in seeing the impact that this law has is that it, it, it allows for fines of up to 4% of a company's annual revenue for violations of GDPR. Um, and those, that, those are potentially tremendous fines, right? I mean, if you look at some of the biggest fines that we've seen in the US under Section 5, um, you're looking at, at fines that, that could amount to to, um, to, to hours rather than days or, or weeks of a, of, a, of a very large company's revenue for, for violations of consent decrees that, um, that have been agreed upon under Section 5. But, um, but you know, a 4% fine, 4% uh, of annual revenue is much bigger. And, um, and the idea there, the thinking there, is that a, a higher fine makes privacy into something that rises from the level of something that's just a cost of doing business to something that becomes a, a, a boardroom level conversation um, because the, the cost of violation is so tremendous. Uh, so that's just one, that's one big difference that I would highlight. Marcus. Yes, um, thank you. So um, the one thing that I want to highlight that's a big difference between the GDPR and the CCPA, for example, is that the, CCP, the GDPR provides for a comprehensive approach to privacy. Mm -hmm. And the key element to that, I think, is the fact that it codified the concept of organizational accountability, which essentially focuses and forces organizations to develop comprehensive privacy in infrastructures um, that cover the entire data cycle throughout the, da the data life cycle, um, throughout uh, the collection up until use and disposition of the data. And it really um, provides a framework for moving away um, from the individual control model, the notice, choice, and uh, consent model, in that it entails many other data um, privacy protective tools that are part of the concept of organizational accountability. So I think this is an important um, difference uh, between the GDPR and the, the, the very narrow CCPA. And I think um, when we talk about what a US privacy framework should look like, we should really look at the concept of organizational accountability and, and, and take that and implement it 
implemented in the U.S. as the foundation for a comprehensive uh, approach in the United States. We can talk about um, organizational accountability more, but um, key elements um, are, are, are um, formal accountability schemes like certifications and, and codes of conduct, which is what Margaret already pointed out, that they are, they are an element of the GDPR. That's also, we, we think that's also going to be a, a very important component for U.S. privacy legislation in the future to enable third-party in, um, involvement through formal schemes like codes and certifications to free up um, privacy enforcement authorities like the FTC to focus on what's important and to extend and, and augment the reach of privacy enforcement through these third-party um, 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 privacy um, accountability schemes like certifications and codes of conduct. And one example that we um, um, like to point out, point to is the, are the APEC cross-border privacy rules, which we think should be part of any um, U.S. framework going forward. And the other important element um, is that um, the entire GDPR is underpinned by a risk-based approach to privacy. Uh, that means that all data processing activities have to be subjected to a risk assessment of some sort. In some context, the risk assessments have to be um, at a higher level and require full-blown data protection impact assessments. Um, but the general idea of understanding your processing in terms of risks and then devising uh, mitigations and controls specifically targeted to those risks is very important and is the other key element I think we can learn from the GDPR for a U.S. framework going forward. There are a lot of issues, but these are the two key um, distinguish distinguishing factors that I can um, point to um, that I think are important. And I just wanted to pick up on, I think, something that both Marcus and Margot mentioned with respect to the accountability piece. We hear a lot about in discussion of uh, what a new federal law should look like. Um, you know, are you going to replace California? And our response to that question is that, first of all, a federal law doesn't mean it needs to be a weak law. Uh, and we want to actually strengthen the protections that are in CCPA. Uh, and when we say that, I think we are sort of referring precisely to what Marcus is alluding to with respect to accountability and with respect to what Margot said about sort of regulating the, the first party use of information. Uh, and so CCPA doesn't really sort of get at that, that underlying risk assessment uh, and what uh, first parties are doing to protect data um, sort of aside from the sharing of data. And that's an area where I think we think it's really useful and that's an area where GDPR um, is also useful. I think another important difference between uh, the GDPR approach and the approaches that we've seen in the United States is that GDPR is obviously built on an EU model, um, a civil code model. And so that necessarily means that the provisions are more prescriptive and more detailed. And what we've seen in the US um, is an approach that strikes a, a little bit of a different balance and therefore you have a little bit more flexibility in how you do things. And so I think we should also highlight as part of this conversation, um, obviously there's CCPA and a lot of states are introducing um, laws that, that mimic those protections um, or adapt them slightly, but there's also a Washington bill pending. Um, and that bill it takes a very different approach. Um, and in many ways, it's more comprehensive like GDPR, but I think it sort of makes adaptations that are, are more reasonable for the US uh, context. And in particular, there are risk assessments that are described there. Um, but essentially, the company is uh, assessing a risk and they're documenting it, but they're not providing that, that information to the DPA, you know, un unless it's upon request, whereas in GDPR, you know, if it meets a certain, cer certain risk level, um, you are, are consulting with the DPA on that processing, um, and before you can proceed, um, there, there's some back and forth, and so I think that may create um, a little bit of friction in terms of um, companies providing services, and so we see different approaches. Like, we share the, the overall arching aim of GDPR, um, is to provide consumers uh, with, with more uh, control over their personal information and to ensure that companies are accountable. And we share the same goals. But I think the real question is, um, how do we implement those protections in a meaningful and effective way, um, in a way that is, fits the US legal culture um, and legal context? And so I think we've seen a number of different approaches, but um, I think those are some differences that I would highlight. And I'd love to jump in, and I, I guess I'll agree a lot uh, of what, what Marcus said and certainly what, what Chandra said as well. Um, with respect to the, you know, I mean, I think most top of mind for everyone is really CCPA and GDPR, you know, the, the two newest laws. So I think it's fair to kind of hash, hash those out and compare and contrast those. And while I agree with Marcus about the GDPR and its structure, um, and it's, I think, I guess it's movement away from notice and, and consent um, by design. I think that's absolutely true, but um, by implementation, unfortunately, it ends up being not the case. You know, and I think because we've got an ambiguous, um, 
you know, uh, implementation structure, really, and enforcement, what we end up with is a regime that is falling back, certainly in, in, in the web context, is really falling back to reliance on consent. And, and I certainly don't think that that's the intent of GDPR, I mean, as written, but it's the reality. If you look at CCPA, um, we've also got a, a new law that, that's very focused on, on notice and control. And, you know, speaking on behalf of NAI and the digital advertising industry, those elements, the FIPS, um, are, they're critical to um, data responsibility, but at the same time, we really feel like, um, you know, Margot used the term uh, paradigm shift. I mean, we really feel like it's time. We, we, we need a paradigm shift back towards accountability, as Marcus mentioned. We need to have privacy laws that focus more on data uses and harms rather than trying to saddle consumers with the responsibility of having to manage their data. And I think, you know, while that will remain a critical element, you know, notice and control, transparency will remain critical, um, the notion of going about it um, you know, as the primary means for privacy protection is is just not very effective. And another element I would point out about the CCPA, which I haven't heard come up much today, is that the CCPA is very unusual in focusing on, on just the sale. So it creates this, this concept, and I think this false sense of security um, or privacy to consumers, the notion of, well, if your data is not being sold, then it's just fine. You know, if your data is collected by a first party, that's great, you can trust them, but it's the third parties. We heard secondary uses uh, a lot today. The notion that secondary uses of data are inherently bad and wrong and, and need to be protected. In some cases, that's certainly true, but, it, but in other cases, there are certainly first party actors that can collect data and misuse that data, not protect that data. So the notion that we need to be protecting consumers on the basis of a sale, a transaction from a thirst, first party to a third party, I think is, is inherently flawed. And I think, you know, as many of us are looking at the CCPA, how it will be implemented, I think people are going to be very disappointed with respect to, you know, that as a framework and, and in terms of, and so when we talk about, like Chandra said, when we talk about a federal law, I mean, I think we can look at the GDPR, we can look at the CCPA, try to take the best elements of those, try to take the flexibility from the GDPR that, that, that I think was intended, frankly, that could be, um, you know, that, that could be implemented. Um, um, try to take some of the, protect the protections, the controls for consumers conceptually from the CCPA, make sure the consumers have those, but really focus on data use, um, unreasonable uses, focus on those, try to get those out of the system. Um, so it, it, I think it's fitting that we started out this morning talking about the goals of um, privacy protection. And um, now that we have this panel on the current approaches and been, have been discussing the specific privacy laws, um, I think um, it'd be helpful to put some meat on the bones. And so, um, uh, Laura, maybe um, would you mind kicking us off on sort of um, your thoughts on what the um, harms that uh, these laws that we've been talking about are trying to address? And then um, we can open up to the panel for um, discussion. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. And I think, um, you know, Margo, Margo and the rest of the panel have, have touched a little bit on this, that both the CCPA and GDPR primarily are focused on, on linkable, tangible harms to the individual and to, and to the transparency and control that an individual may, may need. So the harm may be a lack of transparency, a lack of control to the individual, but really focused um, primarily on the individual, also thinking about individual rights in the GDPR context. And, um, and I think that's something that we're starting to see in some of the conversations around where privacy might go in the US uh, is we're starting to, to talk more about harms that are not necessarily linkable and tangible with respect to the individual. And David, I actually think that, that your comments are, are getting there a little bit, thinking about um, some first party uses of data, that some of, the, uh, some of the things that we might find most concerning about uncontrolled uses of information um, uh, about consumer, informa consumer information right now might be harms like discriminatory advertising, right? They might be harms that fall more broadly on society where it's very difficult to see uh, exactly what the impact is on an individual. So discriminatory advertising, um, amplification of hate speech, po political polarization, misinformation and disinformation, these are a bunch of the things that we're kind of seeing now at the society level um, that could be harms stemming from uses of information and that, that some of these more traditional individual focused privacy frameworks don't necessarily get at, but where the conversation is starting to go. So, you know, for example, we saw, um, I think, 
40, 44 civil rights and, uh, and privacy organizations, our organization was one of them, send a letter uh, to Congress a couple months ago highlighting um, the civil rights principles in the era of big data and talking about the importance of, um, of protecting civil rights in the era of big data and, and high centering these, co these considerations about societal harms in conversations about privacy. Um, but those really are societal harms that traditionally we haven't seen centered in privacy conversations and maybe haven't seen centered in these laws. I think one exception maybe is um, uh, it actually comes from sectoral laws in the US, where you could think of sectoral laws in the US as being framed around the rights of an individual to protect themselves against harm um, that may flow from use of particularly sensitive information shared in, in a sensitive context. But another way to look at sectoral laws is as a way of, uh, of protecting or, or um, or I should say, uh, encouraging um, uh, relationships between individuals and companies or providers in contexts where we view information sharing as, as essential or where we view services as essential. So we have these sectoral privacy laws in contexts like healthcare, education, um, finance, where we really want to, to create trust um, and, uh, and, and incentives for consumers to share information. And that really is sort of, uh, those sort of, sort of are interests viewed through a societal lens and less through a private, through a, an, an individual lens. Um, so, you know, so again, I think that largely we've seen these laws focus on the individual, but we're starting to see the conversation uh, shift more toward privacy interests that affect society. Can I just say it was um, a, it was a, a, a leap, a welcome leap to my mind. So I'm very complimentary. But Jerry, you started with goals, and then you said harms. And for two thirds of the world, they would not agree that harms are the goals of data protection laws. I mean, GDPR certainly doesn't believe that. And frankly, up until quite recently, the U.S. didn't believe it. I mean, we've been saying, Supreme Court's been saying, the Federal Trade Commission said for over a decade that the goal of the privacy protection is consumer control of information, and therefore any uncontrolled use was itself violating that principle. This is, of course, meaningless today when almost all use of information occurs outside of individual control, nor would we want to try to control it. I mean, uh, think about a world of Internet of Things and artificial intelligence and big data, and it's a little bit silly to think that an individual is going to exercise control or really wants to. What we want is for our information to be in control, to be subject to some sort of type of protection that will assure us that if we are harmed by it. And so, in fact, moving the discussion out of Europe, out of CCPA, to instead say, let's talk about what are the actual objectives, what are the harms we are trying to avoid. Those harms may be physical, they may be financial, they may be emotional. I mean, we recognize emotional harm in, in other areas of tort law. There's no reason we wouldn't recognize them here. But that use without control by itself is not going to be a harm. And this is, in many ways, the great challenge of the GDPR. There are a lot of great things in it, but there should be because everything is in the GDPR. There's nothing left out. It's got accountability. It's got risk management. It's got FIPS. It's got consent use 72 times in it. And as a result, you can find anything you want in the GDPR and have no idea what your objective is in trying to comply with it. That's why regulators in Europe are having so much trouble coming up with common standards for what to use. It's why companies are spending billions of dollars on lawyers, which I think is a great thing, and I encourage you to do more of that. <laughs> but that's not a successful privacy law if you bring everyone in a room and nobody agrees what its purpose is. So starting with goals is a really great thing to do. And if those goals are avoiding harms, then defining those harms is a great place to start and would be really useful in the regulatory or legislative environment in the United States. Marcus. Yes, thanks, Jared. I wanted to go in the same direction as Fred just went. I just want to make one additional point is that when we start out, I think the first question uh, around goals should be the, 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 more, the bigger issue is that there really are two goals, that there ought to be two goals. One is to protect individuals against harm. The other goal of a privacy framework should be to enable the beneficial use of information. Since data privacy laws, data protection laws deal with the, the, the handling and use of data, it has to, everything has to be um, looked at through the lens of how can we use data beneficially in the way that it doesn't hurt consumers. So these are actually two separate goals that always have to be kept in mind, and they should be explicitly stated in a privacy law. I, I believe the Brazilian privacy law actually sa says that right up front. There are two goals to privacy laws, protect privacy and enable the use of information. And, and, and the, the whole issue of secondary uses and how we handle them and how we take the consumer 
out of making daily decisions about how data is being used, secondary uses, and, and, and so on and so forth, goes to that issue. So I want to keep this relatively brief because I had the privilege of speaking at the beginning of this panel, but the question of harm, I agree with, with Fred that the, the notion of harm alone doesn't get you what data protection regimes are doing, uh, and that articulating goals aside from the articulation of harm is also important. Um, I wanted to bring us back a little bit to what Laura said about the, the prospect of collective harms, because this is definitely one of the stronger criticisms of the GDPR as a regime, that by focusing so squarely on the individual, it leaves out the kinds of harms that we see on a more society-wide level. That said, the compliance or governance aspects of the GDPR, which require risk assessments, as Marcus mentioned and I discussed in the opening presentation, those do encourage, at least, if not require, companies to think about things on a, a broader impact level. Um, and that's the part of the GDPR that is most of interest to me because it moves away from this notice and choice, solely notice and choice regime, to starting to think about the impact of data use more broadly on society as a whole. Um, the second prong I wanted to introduce into this is that we're all having this conversation in the United States where the notion of data privacy harm is highly contentious in comparison to Europe where it's barely questioned. Um, and you see this in particular with the individual causes of action in the GDPR where an individual just de facto has standing to bring these claims. Uh, in the U US, um, and this was a big issue in the invalidation of the safe harbor mechanism and remains an issue in the conversation about the privacy shield as mechanisms for transferring data from the EU to the United States. The question of whether individuals can have standing even under our, our existing sectoral privacy laws um, is hotly contested. And I think just as a, a broad level observation, you see this strange parallel of two minds um, set of jurisprudence uh, 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 arising at the Supreme Court where the standing doctrine on the one hand uh, arguably seems to be moving towards really concrete Scalia style ideas of harm as measurable in terms of money, reputation, uh, et cetera, where the Fourth Amendment jurisprudence of the United States increase increasingly looks at what we consider to be more big data or mosaic theory based understandings of harm, where you see in Carpenter, for example, or in Jones, um, society-wide assessments of the possibility of a chilling effect from data misuse or from uh, extreme collection even in public spaces. And it seems to me that the Supreme Court has not yet put together those two prongs of jurisprudence to try to figure out how they interact with each other uh, along the issues of what privacy harm actually is. Well, uh, Margo, you've um, raised a number of really interesting issues that um, many of which touch on the question that I wanted to ask next, which is um, the uh, what mechanisms different privacy models, including the ones that you um, introduced to our audience, um, what mechanisms they have to incentivize firms to protect consumer privacy? And, and Marcus raised um, the question of protecting the individual versus enabling the use of information, so query what privacy even means. But, but what mechanisms um, different models have to incentivize um, protecting consumer privacy. So, for example, um, are civil penalties a deterrent? Um, th that is an example of one mechanism, but there are myriad others. And so I, I invite the panel to address that. Yes, Chandra. Yeah, I think civil penalties are absolutely deterrent. Um, you've seen it with the 4% of global turnover for GDPR fines, mm -hmm. um, and that definitely got the attention of the C-suite level of the board, which was good in a way because it provides privacy professionals with the funding um, and the internal support to implement the protections that they need to implement. Um, and with respect to the conversation about a U.S. federal law, uh, my organization, BSA, supports um, the ability of the FTC to get new authority for... Um, initial violations of Section 5. So we think that civil penalties play an important, important role, um, and we support that. But I think it's important to remember that civil penalties and are, are sort of not the only part of the story. Um, and I think it's important to, to ask the question about sort of what else can you do to provide flexibility within the law that would incentivize companies um, to provide meaningful privacy protections. And, and one example, I think, um, alludes to something that I think was discussed on the de-identification panel earlier this morning. Um, and so when we talk about de-identification de in the context of GDPR, um, the European Data Protection Board's uh, predecessor had looked at this issue and essentially requires anonymization. And so within, 
within the GDPR, you're, you're not exempt from requirements because you are taking steps to de-identify data. It's a mechanism to help you achieve compliance, but the, the requirements are not otherwise relaxed. Um, and so I think this is an area that could actually incentivize companies. So will companies really spend the money to invest um, in the research for differential privacy and other privacy enhancing technologies if they're not going to get some sort of corresponding benefit in the law? Um, and so I think incorporating that type of flexibility within the law would, would also incentivize companies to, to implement additional protections. Marcus? So um, in addition to fines, as Chandra mentioned and, and the other items she mentioned, I would again point to the concept of organizational accountability, which requires organizations to implement comprehensive privacy management programs, which is essentially an ex ante exercise to prevent bad outcomes at some point and to, to avoid ex post enforcement. So that's a huge ex ante mechanism to, to get companies up to speed in terms of protecting privacy. And if, in addition to that, they use formal accountability schemes like GDPR certifications, or in the US, some other form of certification, maybe APEX CBPR or industry codes of conduct or something like that. That, again, uh, provides for engagement with the, over the third party accountability agent or certifying body, all ex ante efforts, um, you know, back and forth dialogue in terms of getting companies into compliance with that code or certification. That's a, a huge, that th this concept of accountability, formal or informal, has huge potential for ex ante um, efforts to avoid bad outcomes in the end. And finally, also from the, D from the GDPR, we can um, take the concept of data protection officer, the DPO, which certain organizations have to have um, if they meet certain criteria, which al also forces organizations to focus on privacy um, right from the start and, and to have somebody in charge and responsible and accountable for implementing a comprehensive um, privacy management program. Okay. So, yes, so, so the GDPR aspirationally is largely a collaborative governance regime where what regulators are looking to do in, for the most part, leaving aside individual rights for a second, uh, apologies to all uh, Europeans in the room, um, but what regulators are trying to do is to get private-public partnerships in filling out these broad-level standards. So you have a very vague uh, standard in the text, and then you have encouragement of private companies to come in and say, well, this is how we're going to implement it in our sector and in our practices. For that to work, for that kind of private-public partnership to work, um, you have to have regulators who are both capable of issuing uh, big sticks and decent carrots. So the regulator has to, as, as Laura pointed out, have enough of a capability of issuing fines or invoking some other form of penalty um, that companies are incentivized to actually get in the room. But at the same time, they need to be able to sort of hold off on those fines if necessary um, to make the companies feel like this is a safe space for dis disclosure. And that balance is incredibly notoriously hard to strike. Um, on the one side, it can end up going in the direction of capture, where the agency ends up being bedfellows with the companies. Um, or on the other side of things, it can end up being that you have such an enforcement um, prone agency that companies don't see the incentive to get in the room and provide the details. And then it just becomes vague standards that nobody can comply with. I think that the, the component of the GDPR that is hardest to replicate in the United States is the courts. Um, so even if we end up putting in place a system of individual rights, we still don't have uh, either CJU case law um, or European fundamental rights documents that put data protection or privacy on equal footing with the First Amendment. And that makes calibrating this space for collaborative governance extremely tricky in the United States. Because there, even if you put in place a large fine um, or significant penalties, you run the risk that courts are going to end up undermining that uh, in light of really significant significant important First Amendment values uh, or First Amendment doctrine. I mean, I, I think that really underscores your point about the, this delicate balance, but a critical balance between regulation and kind of co-regulation, right? I mean, we, we've talked about that, and and it, it is it is hard to do, but we do have precedent for that here in the U.S., and I think it's a very, very strong model going forward. I mean, the notion that we would have a comprehensive federal privacy law and have it be able to be enforced without some element of co-regulation where we have public-private partnership and the ability to help. I mean, we, we also agree that the FTC should have expanded authority. We agree in the 
the ability to have civil penalties. We, we agree with um, enforcement by state attorney generals. But at the same time, we still think it's critical, particularly in a world of the IoT and, and, and just a tremendous amount of data collection and use. Um, without some element of, of co-regulation, um, it just can't be, it can't be effectively done. It, it can't, we can't have this worked out through the courts. We certainly don't want it done through a private right of action where you know, we're just litigating it. Um, that's not the model. We do have a model, and I think you know, there have been concerns raised, frankly, about um, COPPA, which is you know, one of the best models that we have. And, and I think some of those are fair concerns, frankly. Um, you know, but we, we have the ability to, I think, empower the FTC to, um, and have a federal law establish um, tighter rules around organizations that can then provide rules for, for companies to follow. And again, I mean, we can't lose sight of, and I think Marcus said this very well, the, the notion of the goals here, wanting to balance the privacy protections, prevent the harmful uses of data, but allow for the innovation. Um, w when you're doing that, I mean, we really need to have a, a structure that's, that, that's flexible enough to provide for that and, and to make that balance. Um, to, to, I, let me just jump in one second. Oh yeah, I, I think there are two things we have to keep in mind, though, and one is big fines with ambiguity in the law are a disaster, and they have almost no incentive effect. So yes, they get everyone's attention, but everyone's sitting around scratching their heads, saying, I have no idea what to do next, because look at them, what they just paid, and they did X, Y, and Z and got no credit for it. That's On so the American. other hand, always a penalty is a failure. In other words, it means the privacy has been violated, the harm's been done, and now we've got a penalty. So really coming back to Marcus's point, the more we can do that tries to avoid that, that tries to create incentives for the better behavior up front, whether that's safe harbors for certain types of behavior, whether that's encouraging you know, data review boards or other types of accountability tools, that the goal is to avoid the situation where we're saying, we got you for having done it wrong. What we want to do is have it not go wrong in the first place. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with that, and I think that that's one of the reasons that rulemaking can be a really important tool, right? To create some uh, to create some certainty at the outset as to what the what the specific rules are, as opposed to the general rules. Um, I, I also wanted to just amplify uh, the the mention just a moment ago, I think, by David of the role of state attorneys general, uh, because I think you know the having more cops on the beat to potentially not only to enforce but to help those who are attempting to comply with the law, to understand what the law is, to provide guidance, right, um, uh, is something that can, that can help to encourage compliance. And, uh, you know, to, and the, the CC, CCPA does this a little bit. CCPA does uh, kind, of, kind of create, um, the, actually, the requirements, I think, someone correct me if I'm wrong here, that the state AG provide um, a, a, a opinions to companies that are, that are seeking opinions. Of course, one of the big problems problems is, is that it creates a bit of, it creates in this instance a bit of a conflict sometimes for that agency and also uh, I think creates this, this new obligation without, without establishing additional resources for the state AG's office to carry out those responsibilities. But there is a recognition that, um, that, there's, a, that there's a role to play here for an entity to help translate the rules for, for companies that are trying to comply. I mean the FTC uh, is, is doing a lot on privacy but, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, I think that it's an agency with about 1,100 staff to it, and um, and and that that agency does a lot more than just than just try to protect uh, consumer digital privacy. So we need more cops on the beat, more agencies, um, ideally state AGs as well, to to help with compliance. Just had one quick wrap up, wrap up, and apologies to Fred for having interrupted earlier. Um, so this this idea that broad standards plus heavy fines is a recipe for corporate uh, compliance disaster. Um, I do think runs really counter to how this is thought about in the EU, not to pick sides on which form is right. Um, but to the extent that we're moving towards a federal privacy law that potentially preempts state privacy laws, it's almost inevitable that we're going to be moving to a vaguer standard um, as opposed to precise rules in that context. And so this we're facing a fork in the road, basically, on which version of this we want to end up doing. And I would just suggest that rushing to a federal privacy law that does preempt state ability to experiment in this area does suggest a push towards broader standards as opposed to more specific rules. The second thing I wanted to bring up, just because it hasn't been raised yet, or at least has been raised presuming that we've left it, um, is the idea of a private right of action. So if we do want more cops on the beat, um, we've heard a lot on this panel so far about the costs of a private right of action uh, in, in privacy laws. 
um, and not so much about sort of the way in which that puts a different kind of cop on the beat, even if it does also make companies terrified. Okay. Um, so I'd like to focus on the, uh, continue our focus on um, uh, U.S. laws. And um, you know, David had mentioned COPPA earlier. And so here in the U.S., we have a number of privacy laws that cover conduct of entities that collect certain types of information, um, such as um, information about consumers' finances or their um, health. Um, various statutes address personal health data, financial information, children's information, uh, contents of communications, driver's license data, viewing, <laughs> video viewing data, genetic data, um, and you know, the list goes on and on. Um, but uh, I guess the question here are, are there gaps that need to be uh, filled with, uh, with respect to certain entities or certain types of data or conduct, and um, why? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, th I mean, I think the answer, I think the answer to that question answer? is yes. Um, but I do think we should acknowledge that the sectoral approach that we have in the U.S., um, sort of developed at the right pace at the right time. Um, and so we targeted areas that were sensitive, like financial information and, and health information and children's information. And so the FTC has capably demonstrated its ability and, and force in those areas. Um, but I think we've seen the marketplace evolve. Um, and so there are now blurred lines in many ways. Uh, so there's been a blurring of the distinction between um, what's personally identifiable information and, and, and what's not, right? Um, and so and now there's just the spectrum of information um, that can lead to sort of sensitivity and very fast. We've also seen um, blurred uh, distinctions among entities with the d diversification of their business portfolios. Um, and we've seen blurred distinctions among industries. Um, and so more and more companies that are traditional brick and mortar or in, in manufacturing are, are embracing technology. And so um, we, we have a blurring of distinctions in myriad ways. Um, and as a result of that, um, the, the framework that we've set is no longer fit for purpose. And, and just to use as an example with respect to HIPAA, um, you know, that is an, a law that applies to protected health information and, and certain healthcare prover providers and business associates. But there are a number of ways um, in which a person's uh, medical information is, is not going to be part of that coverage, right? And, and so to the extent a consumer is uploading their own information on a platform and there's no healthcare provider, it would fall outside of HIPAA. Um, it, HIPAA also pertains to electronic billing records, so are we talking about consumers that are paying in cash? Um, and not to mention the number of health-related apps um, that sort of would, would fall outside of HIPAA as well um, to the extent that, that the cover providers aren't involved. And so, um, and when we talk about this, this, this spectrum of, of information and whether it's sensitive, you know, so our, our view of sensitive data is, is, is it would be medical information, right? But even that health information that falls outside of HIPAA is still personal information that's not protected by that sectoral law. Um, and so I think that's one example where there's a gap. There's obviously many more, um, and that's why we believe a comprehensive federal law is necessary um, both to provide that coverage and also to ensure that all companies and all industries are um, engaging in sound business practices when it comes to consumer privacy. And it's not just gaps, it's overlaps as well yeah. that are the huge problem. So why should it matter when I test my blood sugar, whether I do it in uh, using a medical device and it's covered by HIPAA, or I use my iPhone and it's not covered by HIPAA, or I pay for my hospital bill and it's covered by HIPAA, but when the credit card charge goes through, it's not covered by HIPAA. This makes no sense to individuals who use data in a pretty seamless global way around ourselves that all of these different laws abut or may not actually abut or in some cases actually Okay. Marcus? Yes, uh, thanks. So I agree with everything uh, Chandra and Fred just said. Um, to the extent we need some sec sector specific focus and expertise and more detailed elaboration around certain rules, I mean, I think we could you know, draw from, uh, from codes of conduct and certifications and use that mechanism uh, to provide that kind of um, 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 you know, framework where it's needed. But otherwise, I agree, we, we need a comprehensive baseline approach to privacy that covers all sectors pretty much equally. I do want to just highlight this, this problem that we are running into, though, that, um, that Chandra was just touching on, that the distinction between information that we might, might have previously classified as sensitive and other information <clears throat> um, is rapidly disappearing, if, you know, or, you know, or become, I shouldn't say disappearing, but is becoming less, uh, less of a clear distinction, right? I mean, one can infer 
information about whether or not a person has Parkinson's from, um, from sensors on the phone that, that might detect a tremor in a person's hand, right? One can, detect, one can draw inferences about location uh, of an individual from information about the individuals around them, right? From MAC addresses of nearby devices, information that we might not think of as historic, uh, as traditional location information. Again, accelerometer and other phone sensor information. Um, those can reveal information about uh, not just about location, but also about activities that an individual is, is, is participating in. And that's one of the reasons that it's important for us to focus not just on, in the future, protecting certain classes of, of, uh, classes of information, but also in ensuring that there are guidelines up that prevent information from being used, information about consumers from being used in ways that we find, con that we find concerning. So if we would have found health it, it concerning to use health information about an individual to, um, uh, to target advertisements, to target employment advertisements to that individual, then we might want to prevent other information um, about an individual that could be used to infer health information from being used to target those, those types of advertisements, right? I mean, there are, we might need to start thinking about how discrimination or other harmful data uses could flow from information that isn't historically in the sensitive bucket and, um, and focus on preventing some of those uses. That's absolutely the focus of the NAI is to prevent um, certain types of data use for advertising and to, you know, to prohibit um, some of the, these sensitive areas. But I think, you know, taking a step back, I'd like to build on the conversation talking about personal information. I mean, we are at a, at an, at a point where we've got this expansive definition seemingly broader with every new bill in the CCPA. I mean, I think a couple of people have touched on that already today, how it's just so incredibly broad to roll in everything. So, and what, it, what the impact of that is, unfortunately, um, I mean, I think the, the previous panel, one of the previous panels where um, Jules was talking about um, different types of de-identification and use of pseudonymous data, um, I think is lost on a lot of policymakers today, the notion that you can get good protection from certain types of, around certain types of data, the use of pseudonymous data that is not personally identifiable, identified, tied to a consumer um, that is applied and used with certain controls, technical administrative controls, legal controls, um, is, is a privacy gain. It's a big privacy benefit. It's one that we are, are very proud to have helped deliver in the, in the advertising space. But this is the type of thing that we need used throughout the data ecosystem, is we need to rely on this type of data as much as possible. And we need laws that are going to actually encourage that, rather than discouraging it by just creating a giant bucket and saying, well, everything is personal data. Everything is in the same bucket, and therefore you have to treat it absolutely the same way, and it's all very, you know, it, clearly, clearly a lot of this data um, can be re-identified. We're, we're long into the era of big data and supercomputing, and, and we're going to go further down that path, but but we need to be able to rely on, on, on certain practices, um, privacy protective practices, um, rather than just sweeping everything together. So um, we've gotten a, a number of interesting questions from our audience, and um, I want to, uh, Jared and I would like to take an opportunity to ask a few of them. Um, and the first that I'd like to put to our panel is about regulatory sandboxes. Um, so at the outset, just what, what do you think about regulatory sandboxes? Um, but more granularly, is there precedent for doing it? And how um, can it be done effectively um, without giving companies a free pass. So this was a term or a process that I was less familiar with before I spent time in the EU. Um, the, I think it's interesting to think about the notion of a regulatory sandbox uh, in... And can I just interrupt you? I'm sure. sorry, Margaret. Can, can you define for the audience what, what uh, that means? Effectively, a regulatory safe space for an industry, a nascent industry, to play in, uh, like my toddler. Um, <laughs> while it's trying to figure out, while the, the regulator is trying to figure out what the harms are um, and what the regulations should look like. So this is related to the concept of safe harbors, um, but with a little bit more, I would say, proactivity on the part of the regulator and just deciding this is a space in which we want to, to sort of have a light touch. Um, and again, I think the tension here is exactly, again, what Fred brought up earlier of you need to have vagueness in some ways. Um, it, within the law for a regulator to be able to do that. You risk the possibility of capture if you do that. 
On the other hand, um, it does make the, pot, like, the discussion of harms and concerns about an industry um, much more concrete than if you just uh, full stop employ a precautionary principle and don't let the industry operate um, and decide just to regulate it out of existence or alternatively more the US approach of not regulating it at all until you see concrete terrible harms impacting millions of people across the United States. Um, I would just say I'm a huge believer in regulatory sandbox, but we've been doing it for decades in the United States. It's nothing new. For years, it's possible to come to events like this. You ask questions. You get responses. Um, if you disclose something incredibly revealing, you know it could possibly be used. But on the other hand, it's not generally the way that federal agencies go out looking for information. And I think they're also, to some extent, being oversold in some of the new environments in which they're being developed, which is the same principle is going to apply there. If I go into the, the uh, information commissioner in the United Kingdom and I disclose something that's actually threatening to humans, I'm just guessing they're not going to say, well, it was a sandbox. We don't really care. We'll just wait till we hear about it from somebody else. They're going to say, let's follow up on that right now. I think the point is that regulators serve multiple roles. And again, the FTC has more exposure and more experience at this than anyone. And one of those is being able to participate in a dialogue where you get advice and the advice of others and you get feedback, as opposed to just a subpoena telling you that you now you're in trouble. Um, actually, um, so we're running short on time, and I, I want to give everyone um, uh, th their um, minute or two at the end to give their clothing thoughts. So um, I'm just going to ask one more question um, uh, that we received from the audience. Um, so uh, we've been talking about the roles of state AGs when it comes to privacy enforcement. And um, as other states pass CCPA-like laws uh, with added AG rulemaking, um, are state AGs the appropriate um, uh, agency to provide rulemaking guidance and enforcement? Um, do we need something more akin to uh, EU DPAs? Well, I mean, I think, I don't think we're doing very well with the EU DPAs, so, <laughs> or, or at least so far. Um, I mean, I think that that's the threat we face, right? I mean, whether it's through, I would think through, mainly through a, a state model, but certainly not a, not, certainly not a federal model to empower um, different decisions by different state AGs. I mean, I, I, I think it's fair to say that no, I mean, looking at, at a state legislative landscape and, and a patchwork approach, no one is well served, not consumers, not businesses, by having different privacy, sta you know, different standards in different states. So I think, I, mean, I think we, I mean, I think as a practical matter, we can, we can dispense with that. Um, having AG enforcement, as I mentioned, is, is, is a real, I think, benefit to the FTC. But in terms of having rulemaking authority and, and the ability to, you know, interpret the laws, frankly, if, if we were to kick that to AGs just and, and let them all make decisions, I think we would be back and we'd have just a disparate set of, of decisions that um, would look a lot like if we had a pat patchwork of different legislation. I just want to push back a little bit on the idea that a patchwork is always bad because I think that, you know, I mean, from a consumer perspective, a strong patchwork is better than a weak federal standard, right? You know, so, and if you look at, if you look at data security and breach notification, for example, um, you know, we do kind of, we have this, this patchwork of state laws, if you will, um, and, uh, you know, and, and although there are, there are, of course, complaints about that, it's not universally loved, um, uh, it offers a lot of, it offers a lot of benefits to consumers. One of those is legislative agility. I mean, between 20, between 2015 and 2018, I think 23 states updated their data security and breach notification laws. That's a lot of activity. Um, a lot of that, a lot of those updates happen because state AGs have contact directly with both companies and consumers, see a shifting landscape and make recommendations to the state legislature that it respond to shifting threats. So one of the big things that happened is that a lot of states updated their laws uh, to, to cover health information, not just health information collected by healthcare providers, but maintained by other types of entities as medical medical identity theft was on the rise. So there is sort of this, there's this legislative agility function that having state legislatures and, if, if you will, a patchwork of state laws um, that, that, uh, that, that does serve consumers in many ways. I think I, think I would just add, though, just the premise. Um, I think we want to see a strong federal law. Um, and so I wouldn't assume away the fact that a federal law would be weak. Um, I think we think of sort of replacing state laws is appropriate if we are able to craft a robust and strong federal law. Um, and the other thing is on the data breach notification piece, that's obviously been a, a significant challenge for, for businesses. Um, but I think that 
that problem is, is magnified um, when you talk about sort of these broader privacy issues um, when you're going through the heart of, of um, the architecture and, and what companies are doing and how they share data. And so I think that's a little bit of a different animal than the, this piece of notification um, because the coverage is, is so broad and the impact is so significant. Um, and so I do think that the conflict different and conflicting obligations would um, present a significant challenge. Um, and it's not just about sort of what companies, um, the obligations that they provide, it's also what consumers expect. Um, and so I just think a, a better approach is to have one national standard that provides clear expectations for consumers um, and clear obligations for businesses. But you know, I do agree that that should be in the form of a, a strong federal law, not a weak one. So, Chandra, you've given me um, the perfect opportunity to ask uh, our last question of the, um, of the panel, which is, you know, we've talked uh, over the course of this hour plus about uh, different frameworks and, and, and what, um, you know, different bodies have done to tackle privacy. Um, I guess the question is, you know, what if we were to take different parts from different privacy frameworks that we've been discussing today and that, that you all have studied in your academic work and in the course of um, representing um, your, your various clients, um, what should a federal privacy framework look like? What, what part of existing um, law, such as the CCPA or GDPR or other state law, um, should we use as guideposts? And I'd ask each of you to just take a minute or so um, to address that question. And Chandra, um, you, you started, so, so you, you, get, you get the sure. first swing at this. Sure. Um, uh, so our, our member companies think a federal privacy law should include three key components. Uh, the first is to give, to give consumers the right to know and the right to control what happens to their personal information. Um, the second is to impose obligations on companies to safeguard consumer data and to prevent its misuse. And finally, we, we believe there should be strong, consistent, and effective enforcement. So I'll say, so I think a, a couple things that I would take from GDPR are data minimization and purpose limitation um, and powerful finding authority from CCPA. I probably would take uh, state AG enforcement. And then, but then I also would think that it's really important that we see rulemaking authority to ensure fairness in automated decision making and to, pre to prevent things like discriminatory advertising, not just eligibility determinations, but advertising of opportunities. Um, and a private right of action in no small part because historically disadvantaged Advantaged communities are, have not historically always been protected by agencies when agencies are expected to protect everyone. Well, as, as some of you may have heard, we, we formed a coalition yesterday and announced um, an effort to um, promote legislation, and it echoes, you know, the, what I've said today really echoes that movement, and it, it's really largely focused on the notion of um, enforcing around reasonable and unreasonable data practices, picking up on what Laura said, um, creating clear categories, uses that are, that are, that are unreasonable, and, and those that are reasonable, and building in an opportunity for um, co-regulation, uh, expanding the authority, um, expanding the resources of the FTC and giving them some, I mean, I think some appropriate authority, uh, creating a new Bureau of Data Protection to be able to enforce around this notion of what is unreasonable. I mean, I think the FTC did some really good work over the last couple of years under Acting Chairman Olhausen, really assessing informational injuries, and I think we can all, we could all define them differently. I think we can all degree they're nearly impossible to clearly define. But, but we need to protect against those, those practices, those bad practices. So a, a framework that can really help us do that and let us be able to use uh, data for good purposes, promote innovation, and continue doing things that consumers want. So we need a comprehensive baseline privacy law. Um, we think it should be based on the concept of organizational accountability. It should take the risk-based approach. It should employ codes and certifications to outsource, so to speak, some of the other functions that otherwise would belong to the FTC. Um, there should be strong enforcement powers by the FTC. Um, I think ultimately we should use the accountability, the accountability model to move away from this situation that was discussed in the earlier panel where everything is about consumer expectations, secondary uses that you can pick and choose from and, and you, where you control everything that happens to your data. Instead, we want to create a system where Every organization that touches data is sort of tied into this organization uh, accountability framework that is enforced against them and that enables consumers not to worry about secondary uses that are otherwise beneficial for society and for themselves. And for organizations that are implementing accountability to focus on risks and harms and to have an obligation 
to prevent those. So to free up consumers from having to be engaged every day, every single day on what happens with the data and what doesn't happen. There's a, there a, there a place for consent and for making choices, and I fully agree with, with some of the examples that were given, but for the most part, um, as Fred has suggested earlier, I th that's no longer possible and feasible. Finally, um, a, a, a U.S. privacy framework should be interoperable as much as possible with other frameworks like the GDPR for consistency purposes to, it would, that would benefit uh, companies in terms of implementation, it would help regulators in terms of, of enforcement and would help consumers in terms of providing consistency uh, across the globe. But that, this interoperability or alignment with other models should not come at the expense of undermining the U.S.'s ability to continue to innovate and to work with data effectively, and that should be protected, and that should be part of the goal of any new privacy law. I feel sort of lonely up here. Everybody has a we that they speak for, and I, I don't know, Margo, do you? Um, Margo and I just speak for all rational people everywhere, and we think, um, I think there are really six elements that should be key here, and one is put consent back in a box. It should not be the dominant focus. It's not rational, it's not usable, it's not workable, and it's frankly not fair to individuals to say that we're going to be held responsible for the uh, effects of decisions we may not even know we're making, even though we can't possibly understand what those effects are going to be. Uh, two, I would focus a lot less than U.S. law has historically done, and certainly than European law does, on collection and much more on use. What we've learned, especially in the area of government collection of data, there's always a legitimate reason to collect it. There is always a legitimate use. You need it for a credit card transaction. You need it for online. You need it for dealing with a doctor. You need it someplace. And what we don't want to limit our focus on is the terms under which it's collected, but rather what is it being used for, and more importantly, what is it being reused for, and how is it being used in ways that may be shocking or potentially harmful. Third, accountability, which I think Marcus has been eloquent on, but again, the notion of responsible stewardship of data and that we expect organizations that collect and use data to do so in a way that is responsible and that they will be accountable when those data cause harm. That suggests the fourth, which is uh, what the Europeans call a risk assessment model, but basically a harm-based model, that that should be the focus. We're not trying to nail down everything. We're trying, like most consumer protection laws, to prevent um, um, harms that can be prevented. And there's a lot that we agree are harms, and then that leaves an area where folks can rationally disagree and courts might play a role. Fifth, vigorous federal enforcement and a federal regulator. I, I personally think that should be the Federal Trade Commission, but it would mean a, a lot more staff, and it would clearly mean rulemaking authority. It's not sufficient to say after the fact what's been done wrong. And finally, remembering what I'm now going to call the Hyder principle, and that is on the other side of this balance are the extraordinary benefits we get from the widespread use of information. And they're important economically, they're important personally, they're a foundation of a good part of the 21st century economy, and people love those benefits and expect those benefits. And so we should keep in mind this is a balance at all times. It is not a single focused issue. Um, I have 17 seconds to say my concluding thoughts on this. Uh, and I think that largely we'll be in agreeing on a lot of the high principles and disagreeing on some of the probably most important decisions. Um, and those things that the, are the focus of most disagreement include both the issue of preemption and the issue of private rights of action. Um, the second sort of substantive category I would add in there we didn't get time to talk about today, um, but where I agree that focusing only on notice and choice uh, is, is a very limited way of looking at privacy and in fact in practice has been individually disempowering. There are elements of individual empowerment that I think are important and principles about data collection that are also important that exist in the EU regime and don't exist here. So in the CCPA, we don't really see, as I said, much in the way of purpose limitation, um, purpose specification and use limitation principles. We don't see data minimization principles. Um, and the use case I'd like us to try to think through a little bit when we're trying to find points of disagreement rather than agreement is the idea of monitoring of biometric information in public spaces. I think that teases out a lot of the the divides uh, potentially in these communities. Very last, I promise. Um, we've long seen a hybrid state federal regime 
where we conceive of data privacy, or I guess privacy more generally, as being simultaneously a global federal issue um, and a highly localized issue. And as we move to a world of smart cities and CCTV monitored public spaces, states and even municipalities really do see those concerns as being issues that are subject to their purview and even local police powers. Thank you. Um, and thank you. Um, uh, uh, please give our uh, panelists a round of applause. And with that, um, um, we'll start our break. Um, and please uh, return uh, promptly at 3.45. Thanks.
Uh, and if you would all um, just take your seats, we have one more uh, panel discussion this afternoon. Uh, so before the break, we had uh, the first part of the current approaches to privacy. And for our last panel discussion today, we have um, current approaches to privacy part two. And what we will be doing um, is trying to um, uh, take some of the, the broad principles that we talked about before the break and make this a little bit more concrete. So we're going to be walking through five hypothetical scenarios uh, in which uh, these panelists are going to be trying to uh, tackle specific problems and try to unpack how would CCPA deal with this problem? How would GDPR? How would the US sector specific approach? Uh, but before we get into the substance of that, let me take just a moment to introduce myself, my co-moderator, and, um, and our esteemed panelists today. My name is Elisa Gilson. I'm an attorney in the, in the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection. My co-moderator is Andy Arias, uh, uh, also an attorney in, in the Privacy Division. Uh, and here today, we have Lothar Dieterman, who's a partner at Baker McKenzie, Jay Edelson, who is the founder and CEO of Edelson PC, Rebecca S. Engrave is a partner at Perkins Cooley, Alan Rawl is a partner at Sidley Austin LLP, and Tracy Shapiro is a partner at DLA Piper. And so how we're going to um, start off um, with our panel today is um, Lothar is going to tackle our first uh, hypothetical. He's going to take a few extra minutes to kind of lay some groundwork on some of the key differences between CCPA, GDPR, and other laws. Uh, after um, he takes that first crack of the hypothetical, we'll open it up for discussion with the rest of the panelists, and then um, we'll be moving along to the next hypothetical. So with all of that said, I'll hand over the clicker to uh, Lothar, and thank you very much um, for taking us to um, the very first hypothetical. And um, I'm sorry, if you could just click the slide one forward. Um, I'll just read the hypo, um, and, uh, and then we'll get started. So company A, a US startup with a German subsidiary, offers a newsletter for cycling enthusiasts with information on safety, health, and new cycling products. It's funded through ads. It is developing a new product that can sense dangers, such as weather changes or drunk drivers, and warn cyclists. Health insurance companies, automakers, and city planners seek access to its data. One day, an engineer inadvertently accesses a file containing name and health insurance provider for 200,000 employees and newsletter subscribers. Lothar, what are the uh, implications for this company's practices under various legal regimes? Um, please, please walk us through that. I will walk you through and I'll lay the groundwork to that you invited me to lay. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's wonderful to be in DC, particularly at cherry blossom time. And I agree with Commissioner Phillips wholeheartedly that it was a fantastic set of panels today. I very much enjoyed this today and tomorrow. Um, what I've heard, and I'll try to lay a little bit of this groundwork and apply the insights and the broad principles and the purposes of different approaches to privacy law for our panel, which is now going to apply this to concrete hypotheticals. The current approach to privacy law vary from country to country based on different needs and preferences of people or governments for information, for human dignity, security, privacy, freedom, and technological innovation. Let's start with Europe, the old country we heard, to protect privacy and prevent George Orwell's vision of 1984, the European countries regulated data processing as such with a prohibitive and bureaucratic regime. European countries prohibited data processing by default and companies and governments must not collect, use, share personal data except as specifically permitted. The basic idea was the less we use computers and data, the better for data privacy. This is from the 1970s. This was harmonized in 1995. The question was raised what the purpose was. It was a trade measure to enable free flow of information within Europe and cut off flow to other countries. That was the 95 directive, and that idea of the free flow of information in Europe for economic development is still in the GDPR. So what happened through the 70s? European citizens embraced information technologies made in the US, increasingly in Asia, the same compromise on privacy as elsewhere. Where the European governments were constrained by data protection laws and intelligence gathering, foreign governments, including the US NSA, stepped in. And where the European companies were hindered in developing information technology products by these data processing regulations, U.S. companies stepped in. Effective May 
2018, the EU GDPR doubles down on this approach of the 70s with even more prohibitive data processing regulation and large fines that are intended for US tech companies specifically as publicly stated. Additionally, the German government came up with creating property rights and mobility data to protect the local auto industry from competition, which underlines that one of the purpose of privacy and data protection law is also trade. Now, we already heard about the US approach, very different path, data processing as such is allowed, and we have focused on harm sector situation specific privacy laws that are constantly updated, supplemented, and harshly enforced, which has not been true in Europe for much of the 50 years of history there. We have in California the first data security breach notification law worldwide, 2002, it took the Europeans 16 years to follow this. We had the first law requiring privacy notices for websites, 2004. We have dozens of other privacy laws. We have one for supermarket club cards. We have one for RFID tags. We have one for automated license plate scanners. And that's important to understand when CCPA is sold as an omnibus law, it's just one of literally dozens of laws in California alone in one state of the United States. I believe these laws have effectively protected individual privacy against newly emerging threats while allowing technology to thrive. And the FTC has done its part in developing a body of data privacy and security law that is focused on preventing consumer harm. But after enacting laws for 50 years, situation specific, and without repealing, harmonizing or updating the existing laws and streamlining them, simplifying them, the US are now also suffocating innovation and business. The California Consumer Privacy Act against data sharing overburdens companies with excessive, complex, rigid, and prescriptive requirements. If other states follow and Congress does not preempt, only the largest of companies will be able to handle compliance. Now let's look at Asia a little bit too. I'm at the West Coast. We don't just look to Europe. The Asian countries strongly encourage and support data-driven innovation. The People's Republic of China focuses its data laws not on individual privacy, but on data residency requirement, internet censorship, and protecting Chinese-owned companies against foreign competition. China mandates Chinese companies to develop and apply artificial intelligence, big data analysis, social scoring, and we see other countries taking their own path. India is following a hybrid approach, combining the Chinese and Russian data residency requirements with European data processing regulation. But most of the other countries are more or less following the European data processing regulation approach, at least on paper. If the United States also follows the European approach and regulates data processing with GDPR-like law, established multinationals will appreciate and benefit from international harmonization for sure. But startup companies will be hampered and innovation will slow. This will hinder progress in autonomous vehicles, artificial intelligence, and as we heard on one of the previous panels, in the healthcare sector. I believe it will be literally unhealthy. The United States follows Europe or stays on its current course and fails to streamline and harmonize its myriad privacy laws. I expect that global innovation leadership will move to Asia. In a few years, US citizens will then be using technologies made by Chinese companies the impact on individual privacy, national security, and the economy in the United States would be similar as in Europe since the 70s. And in that sense, I think we should and can learn from the European approach, which will now apply to our hypotheticals. We start with the hypothetical that Eliza just read and take a look at the benefits that this company offers to consumers and the risks to privacy. The benefits include global local information free of charge for cyclists. I'm a cyclist enthusiast, I appreciate this greatly. And it is developing life-saving new cycling safety technologies, which are very much needed, as healthy as cycling as a danger that it is. And it offers attractive jobs in the technology sector. Now there are risks. They include, as we heard the previous panel and the first panel today, and also in the ninth session December 12 from Professor Solov. Discrimination by employers, insurance companies based on habits, health conditions, is embarrassment, fraud, stalking, and many other harms that we should definitely take into account. Now, how do these different approaches to privacy now have an impact on this company in our hypothetical? 
The EU GDPR does not, contrary to common belief and is often emphasized as an opt-in law, would not require this company or its German subsidiary to obtain consent from consumers. European companies can and often must rely on alternative means of justifying their data processing against this general prohibition of data processing and rely on things like necessity to perform contracts or legitimate interests that are not outweighed by the overriding interests of the data subjects. The GDPR, as broad as the prohibitions are, as broad and vague are some of the exceptions. But the GDPR also puts a lot of paperwork obligations and data minimization on our company. It asks to issue very specific notices that are different and have different requirements that are not really compatible with the kind of notices that the FTC requires, which have to be understandable by consumers, not possible with the details required for 12 to 13 uh, GDPR. They have to satisfy data access portability deletion requests free of charge to individuals, but to the public and community. Appointment of a data protection officer, designation of a local representative for the US company, data protection impact assessments, documentation to demonstrate, it goes on and on, particularly also satisfy the international transfer restrictions that are specifically benefiting the European companies and to the disadvantage of foreign companies. The compliance is very start uh, expensive for the startup company, and these requirements are not focused on any particular harm, as was noticed on the previous panel. The privacy harms are not core and center. It just discourages data collection on this idea, the less data collect, the better for data privacy. Now, the CCPA does its own part here. It doesn't prohibit anything. There's no data minimization in there, but the CCPA will require in conjunction with other California laws, very specific and elaborate disclosures that are not compatible with other US laws or the GDPR. Um, companies, if they want to share data with other companies in certain circumstances, have to put a special link on their website that says your California privacy rights. They have to put a link under the CCPA for do not sell my personal information. And if every state in the US and every country does that, then all the websites and the mobile pages of the world will be full and we won't put any other content on them. Also, the California residents may opt out of information selling, but remain entitled to service, which we heard on a previous panel will cause companies to start charging for uh, services that are now available for free, which will take one important consumer benefit away. Residency requirements in countries such as Russia, China, in India, the bill is pending, Indonesia, and Kazakhstan, will require our startup company to establish a local presence to keep all data there so it's accessible to the local government, which startup companies often can't afford to do. Plus, in China, a company that's not Chinese-owned can't do much over the internet anyhow under the regulatory regimes. Perhaps the biggest impact for our company that wants to develop this safety device, though, and this one is not about advertising, as pretty much all previous panels were focused on, is to develop these sensors and train the self-learning algorithms. They need to collect data on public places, on public roads. They don't need identifying information, but they need data on what a person looks like, S sounds, smells, acts, and so on. And this is personal data under European law, personal information under the CCPA. And companies should be able to exchange this information with other companies, otherwise every single company has to drive around everywhere to collect this information. But the GDPR makes this extremely difficult and nearly impossible for a company in another country due to the restrictions on special categories of personal data. You have to get consent for transfer to the US, which is impossible. You can't drive around on the street and then get parental consent in writing from a kid that happens to be um, on the camera. Similarly, the CCPA requires opt-in consent from teenagers and also parental consent from minors, which is just not practical. So these technologies will not be developed with input in California, with data from California. In China, the activities are encouraged by the government for Chinese companies. Now, the second part of a hypothetical is one that is, illustrates a slightly different point. That's the data security breach. And we heard on the previous panel what a hard time companies have when they're faced with such a situation. I think the practitioners on the panel will agree. You have to look at 50 different state laws now, <clears throat> plus different countries' laws, to determine who you have to notify in Europe, in what language, what regulator has to be notified in 72 hours. 
And that adds a huge compliance burden. Plus, on top of it, if this list with just people's name and the name of their health insurance company is lost, then everyone on that list is entitled to between $100 and $750 statutory damages under the California law without any showing of harm. With this hypothetical, I mean to illustrate just a few points, namely that the broad prohibitions on data processing and also data minimization cause too much collateral damage and don't do enough for privacy. The data genie is out of the bottle. The data is everywhere. We need to focus on the harm that it causes and specifically legislate that. As we heard on the previous panel, if discrimination is the problem, then we need to prohibit that form of discrimination and act on it and enforce and not just prohibit every data sharing and collection. The data processing regulations in Europe have been largely ineffective. The GDPR is not a modern law. It's 50 years old. It's doubling down. And similar threats follow from the excessively prescriptive and complex disclosure requirements and data subject rights like the CCPA, particularly since that is one law for 50 states. Diverging disclosure, breach notification, other requirements at state level hamper interstate commerce should be harmonized nationwide. And I personally believe the United States and the FTC have been on the right track to focus on consumer harm and individual privacy, but they do need to now streamline and harmonize the existing laws so that organizations, particularly smaller business, can realistically understand and comply with privacy laws. Otherwise, these laws will be counterproductive if nobody can follow them anymore. I'm looking very much forward to our discussion after this little bit of groundwork. Lothar, thank you very much for that. Uh, so let me open it up to the rest of the panelists. Lothar, you did a very good job of kind of detailing some of the issues with this hypothetical. But I'm curious if you all have any other thoughts about maybe some of the issues that he may not have been able to cover that kind of pop into your minds. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to jump in. <laughs> Jay, please. Um, so I come at this from a totally different perspective. I'm on the plaintiff side. I represent uh, class actions and also regulators uh, at the state, city, and county level. The, the first thing, um, it was interesting to hear that, that if we have strong privacy laws, then it's going to stifle in the innovation and everything's going to go to China. I, I, I think that, that that's really not going to happen. Let's focus on what most privacy laws are, and those are consent laws. And that really, for me, the, the focus of the hypothetical has to start with that, which is, did company A, did this startup get consent? And it's really not hard to do. That's why I don't think it's a huge burden. It's not going to stifle innovation. All they have to do is say, here's what we're collecting, and here's what we're going to do with it. Now, an issue which was brought up and also was brought up in previous panels was we've got all these different laws. There's federal. I'm going to focus on, on American law, the, the one thing I, I know about. I'll leave the EU to you. Um, this idea that if we have differing laws, we're all going to just, it's too much to handle. First, for data breach notification, I think it proves the opposite. We've, we've seen that companies have no problem um, complying with the myriad uh, data breach notification laws, although I agree having a uniform law there might be helpful. With regard, though, to laws more generally, if you look at, at what plaintiffs, whether they be regulators or private citizens, sue under, they generally start with consumer fraud statutes. So the FTC will look under um, Section 5 of the FTC Act. Um, you'll see state uh, attorneys general will look at consumer fraud statutes uh, when there are damages, and we can get into what it means to be damaged. Private litigants will look, in, will look at consumer fraud statutes there. And again, the big issue is let's look at what the public facing statements are and compare them to what actually is happening. And if there's a mismatch, then that's when the company ought to be held accountable. Anybody else on the panel have any additional thoughts? Just a small point. Um, I think I heard you correctly to state that um, in th for the breach part of the hypo, uh, that you would see uh, uh, th that this would this this would trigger under the CCPA and potentially have the private right of action. Um, and of course, none of this has been litigated yet. But there is some language in that that I think would might make it such that set aside for the moment whether it's it's a reportable incident under existing California law that the private right of action wouldn't apply there. Um, 
because some of the additional language there is whether it's subject to unauthorized access and exfiltration, theft, or disclosure as a result of the business's violation of the duty to implement and maintain reasonable security procedures and practices. So I think maybe we just don't know yet. I think we'd need to know more facts about this fact pattern. Um, how inadvertent was it? Uh, were there good procedures and practices in place? Um, and so I think like there just might be a little bit more going on to that question. I would add the same thing with regard to the health insurance question. Um, that they're, if they start selling information to health insurance companies, we'd want to know more like, are they advertising that as a purpose for the use? Are they marketing the data? And that way, is it a Spokane situation? Is there a risk that they become a consumer reporting agency because they're marketing the data for purposes of making eligibility determinations? Thank you. Okay, since our time is short and we want to cover all the hypos, we have five hypos for you all, we're going to go ahead and cut the discussion here and move on to the next hypothetical. So a hypo two, company B develops a free mobile app with a location sharing opt-in that offers shopping discounts based on location. City planners interested in making downtown shopping areas more walkable offer to pay for access to the app's data. And Rebecca, per perhaps you can start us off uh, with this hypo. Sure, so I think um, for me it's helpful to kind of take it into really concrete questions in terms of is this okay or is it maybe okay depending on different facts. And I, I think it's important to keep in mind that the hypo itself um, gives us the concrete fact that the original location sharing is opt-in. So we can all just assume that. We don't have um, people who don't know that the location data is being collected and they had a choice, it was opt-in. Um, so as to the second part of it though, about can company B share it with the city planners when they offer to, to buy this data to kind of help solve the problem of the dying downtown and retail and they wanna see where do shoppers actually like to go um, and kind of how do they walk through the city. Um, if we take it through these three different regimes, I think if we, if we, well, we're gonna have to assume a couple things. We're gonna to have to assume that there's no, um, as Jay mentioned, of course, a first step in US privacy law is what disclosures have been made and are they true? So we can just assume that this isn't at odds with any disclosures that have already been made um, to consumers. So there wouldn't be an existing deception issue. Um, if we assume that, then under US laws that exists right now, in my view, kind of section five, the state UDAP laws, um, there's no special law applicable to this company. It's not in a regulated sector. So th there's no particular opt-in or opt-out requirement. We're just in the land of general consumer protection. Be honest and accurate in how you describe your product. And if you're not, um, if, if this isn't at odds with anything that they've said, I don't think there's any particular opt-in or opt-out requirement. If we then shift to CCPA, um, that's a more interesting question there. Um, CCPA, of course, does have a disclosure and opt-out, not opt-in, but opt-out required for sharing of data with a third party when it's a sale. And here the hypo is telling us that it would be a sale because the city planners are offering to pay for it. Um, so if that's all that's going on under the CCPA analysis, then consumers would have a right both to be specifically informed about this and opt out of it. Um, I do think under the CCPA there's a question that would come up about the fact that this is a city getting the data. Um, there are several provisions in the CCPA that speak either to different levels of law um, or to uh, kind of just different, different aspects of how governments might or might not either fall within this and here they're not even the subject, they're the third party. Um, so certainly haven't thought all that through, I don't have an answer for you, um, but I can definitely say in my look through CCPA preparing for this, I'm highlighting a lot of provisions that talk about government and different aspects of, of uh, levels of law and I think that there very well could be a different answer under the CCPA for data sharing with governments as opposed to data sharing with, with other private companies, even if it's um, a paid exchange. And I'm curious actually if others on the panel see the same issue there. Um, but just to kind of close it out here on the front end question of do you need opt-in consent for this, from a GDPR perspective, it's interesting. We, I think we tend to think, oh, the GDPR is so protective, EU is much more conservative. 
you know, interestingly, there's, again, no opt-in or opt-out specific requirement here. Unless the company were planning to rely on consent, which it likely wouldn't because it's very rare to rely on consent because of how onerous that standard is in the EU, they presumably would be lying on a different legitimate interest. Um, so long as you have a legitimate interest, your obligations to provide transparency about what that basis for processing is, but there isn't a specific sort of opt-in or opt-out um, requirement. So, um, if, so we've worked all that through. The company's decided that yes, they can share. Um, they've checked their disclosures. They know their privacy policy. Kind of, it's great. It already says we share with third parties. Um, uh, kind of a, a next kind of, kind of threshold gating question to think about, I think, would be, does it matter how many subscribers this app has? Um, and there, we also do see a little bit of a distinction from the CCPA. Um, and there are some really re real practical questions for companies about those triggering thresholds under the CCPA. Um, there's three of them. Do you have 50,000 California residents? Um, or gross revenues in excess of 25 million? Or at least 50% of your annual revenue by selling the personal information of California residents? So this business, again, we don't know the facts, but depending on if they're based in California, if this particular form of data sharing and the money they earn from it is really their only source of revenue, um, uh, and or I, it's a small app, so they definitely don't have 25 million in revenue, I'm making that up. Um, so they may or may not come within a CCPA type law if there are these thresholds to it. The existing federal regime, of course, doesn't have any particular thresholds. GDPR also doesn't have any particular um, thresholds, but that could be another way where the regimes differ and how they treat it. This app, interestingly, some apps are going to have a real challenge figuring out where their residents are located um, in terms of deciding which ones they're going to decide are entitled to CCPA type rights. Um, you know, that's a great benefit, actually, of online services. And if you're doing a good job of following your privacy principles of data minimization and not collecting data that you don't have, an app like this may very well have username and email address. I mean, it's a pretty thin, simple app. Um, so uh, unless they're just going to draw inferences from IP address, they're not necessarily going to know where their residents are located unless they try to backtrack from their location collecting portion and say that anybody who walks in you know, Menlo Park is a resident of California. Um, visitors from Illinois, I don't know how that would work out. Um, so I think the third piece that I'll talk about then before we open it up to the panel is to think about, well, what if the city has a breach? So the city's received this data, um, kind of worked through all the steps, and you know this, the company B was fine sharing it. Um, but the city doesn't have great data security. They have a lot of turnover. Every time there's a new administration, this is just a file sitting around, and they have a breach. What happens then? Um, under existing law, location information alone wouldn't trigger breach reporting in the United States. Um, in Europe, it might. The standard there would be a, a substantial um, risk to the substantial rights and freedoms of, of the data subject. And if you have a lot of location information, um, we also don't know from this hypo if the city planner is seeing each of these data points as just individual data points or if the city planner knows that it's person A making all of those data points. Can't tell that from this. But that distinction may make a difference to um, your European breach reporting obligation there as well. Um, but as to who does the breach reporting, that would also be an interesting question here if it's a city planner breach. Um, we've got kind of existing, you know, that happens in the United States. We already have plenty of fact patterns of where a downstream vendor or service provider encounters a breach. Um, they need to tell the first party from whom they got the data, but it's the first party um, that would conduct the breach reporting. Um, here there could be some interesting questions depending on what time the breach has happened. Um, in terms of ability to find the, the, the folks and provide notifications. Well, thank you, Rebecca. That's um, a, a, a great job uh, spotting some, some tricky issues. We've gotten an interesting question from our audience. Um, if the app says, we collect location information to provide you discounts, 
Is it a deceptor fa deceptive failure to disclose under Section 5? I'll jump in on that. Um, so I think, it's a, I think it's a very challenging question, and I, uh, a lot of my clients debate this issue with looking at the Golden Shores case that the FTC brought, where there was a flashlight app. They were collecting geolocation information. Didn't, there they didn't say that they were collecting it or sharing it, and there was nothing in the privacy policy. So I think there is this question of, okay, if, if we're not that severe, and the consumer expectations were such that you would never think that your flashlight app is collecting location, but let's say you've got an app where it is expected that location would be collected, like here, it's clearly disclosed that it is, do you need to have that sharing in your just-in-time disclosure, or can it be in the privacy policy? You know, the FTC has certainly said we want it to be an opt-in for the sharing of the location data, and we want it to be just in time, but it was a consent order, it's not binding law, um, but you know, do you want to be the company that tests that by not following Golden Shore's order? You know, I would add, if this is taking place in California, and if with all the walking and cycling going on, and the CCPA, I'm sure everything is taking place uh, in California, there might be a cow appa uh, the statute in California that requires uh, privacy policy disclosure for online <laughs> collections of personal information about California residents. And if that doesn't include a disclosure of uh, selling to the city, there, there might be an issue there. Uh, another kind of off-the-wall issue here, uh, you know, we're, at this, uh, we're kind of uh, brainstorming here and uh, um, free association, um, is this is a city. Is, it, is surveillance involved? Uh, and that's an issue that might be of concern to people. And is the Stored Communications Act uh, involved where if, uh, if they're a uh, communications provider, this app, which is sometimes an ambiguous uh, uh, category, uh, they would require, in order to provide the information to a government agency, some kind of uh, legal process, like a subpoena, unless, of course, it, with, it were with the uh, consent of the, of the walkers uh, here. Uh, one last uh, comment um, is the, the ambiguity in, um, uh, in California uh, for opt-in versus do not sell. So what if they, the, the people who are using this op app opted in specifically to all kinds of stuff, uh, and then the you know, California CCPA goes into effect and they're pushing do not sell buttons all over the place. Uh, did they really mean that? Did they really mean to omnibus don't sell when they want all these discount uh, mm. coupons? So you know, we'll, we'll see how that, uh, how that plays out. Um, just on that last point, I think the CCPA is pretty clear that people could opt out then and then companies can't ask them to opt back in for a year if they made a mistake. When I looked at this hypothetical, I was going to say to my client, you know, the discount model you can do without data sharing because the consumers will go and show the discount and that's how the merchants see that this is effective and that's how they'll pay you. But the city planners get no more data from you because that would trigger the do not sell my information link on the mobile app that causes a lot of hassle. And at the Smart Cities Conference in Stanford, the city's planners have already complained that they're not getting personal data or, or any data from the private sector anymore with these privacy laws becoming more and more burdensome on companies who want to share for public purposes because any benefit under the CCPA will count as selling. So even if there was some other leniency or some benefit that the city would offer instead of cash, it's selling, it would trigger the link. And many companies don't want that ugly link on their sites, and they will just stop sharing data. That will be the impact of the CCPA, I think, on this hypothetical. Well, in the uh, interest of time, let's move on to the next hypothetical. Though I think uh, Lothar's statements are actually pretty timely about the do not sell my personal information because this hypo is going to cover a little bit of that. All right. So company C sells fertility trackers in which users can record the dates of sexual activity and diagnosis or treatment for an STD. Company C decides to provide access to de-identified data sets to pharmaceutical companies, public health advocates, and advertisers. Carla Consumer doesn't want her personal information to be sold. Frustrated that she can't find a do not sell my personal information link, she deletes the app. A year later, Carla asks Company C to delete all information about her. Tracy, can we talk a little bit about the privacy implications of this scenario? 
Sure. So, you know, first I would think about what the legal framework is here and what laws might apply. So, you know, whenever there's health data, my first question is always, is there a HIPAA issue? Um, there's no mention to the fertility tracker being a covered entity that gets reimbursed or electronically bills insurance providers. It doesn't sound like it's a service provider to uh, fertility doctors. So there's probably no business associate BAA kind of governing the use of the data. But of course, not being covered by HIPAA doesn't mean that you're not uh, regulated. The FTC, as I'm sure everybody knows, has made clear that they view uh, health data as being sensitive information. And I, I'm sure they would consider uh, STD and sexual activity related information to be sensitive. Um, so you've got to think about the implications there with regard to data use and data sharing. I would be thinking about the NAI guidelines. It says they're sharing with advertisers. Unclear if there's OBA going on, but the NAI speaks to the use of sensitive information, including STD-related information for targeted advertising and the need to get an opt-in. Uh, I'd be thinking about CCPA, which doesn't specifically address health information, but talks about um, data sharing and places restrictions there. I think about CALAPA and transparency requirements, and then, of course, uh, GDPR and considering whether you've got a legal basis for processing this data. So with that framework, I think there are a few big issues that jump out at me in the hypo. Um, one, there's the sharing of de-identified data with these three entities. Uh, and it sounds like it's a new use of sharing. So it says that company C decides to do this, which suggests it might be a change in its practices. So with the de-identification, I'd be thinking about uh, does this de-identification practice that company C implements, does it comply with the various standards for de-identification? So with CCPA, we've got a super broad definition of personal information and a really broad and quite circular definition of de-identification. Um, so I think a lot of us are struggling to figure out exactly what de how one can actually de-identify data at this point under that law. Um, it also requires that one puts in place technical and business processes to prevent the de-identification of data. So we'd need to, company C would have to look at its contracts that's got in place with these recipient entities. If, uh, if Carla's not in California, um, I'd also be thinking about FTC guidance. I, on earlier panels, they talked a lot about the de-identification standards um, for, uh, that are set forth in the FTC privacy report. You'd also need attestations by the recipients that they won't make efforts to re-identify the data. Uh, and then if she's in the EU, I'd be thinking about GDPR, which also has you know, an incredibly high uh, bar for anonymization, and most likely Company C won't be meeting that standard and disclosing the data. So then we've also got this change in the treatment of data. Um, you know, it is a, a very basic and longstanding FTC principle that if you have a material change to retroactively collected information, um, the FTC wants you to get opt-in consent for that. Um, so you'd have to consider here, is this a material change in the treatment of information? I'd want to be looking at what company C told users uh, in the privacy policy with regard to how they share data. It could be that they had a super broad disclosure that would maybe cover this, um, but if not, they'd want to be thinking about whether they need to get an opt-in consent for that. Um, I think about Cal Opa, which says in your privacy policy, you've got to say how you're going to notify your users of material changes. So you'd want to make sure whatever method you set forth there, you're complying with that. Um, and then, of course, for GDPR, you'd want to be thinking, you know, do you also need to get consent for these disclosures? And then two other considerations. So we've got Carla um, wanting to opt out. She doesn't want her personal information to be sold, and she's frustrated. So, you know, one, if I were company C, I'd want to be thinking about if she's a California resident or not. Um, as Rebecca touched on, hard to know how company C would make that determination at this point. They probably don't have address information. Fertility tracker apps don't tend to collect that kind of information. Can they use IP address? Hard to say. Hopefully, we'll get more guidance from the California Attorney General on that. Um, and then are they, selling, are they selling information? Is this a sale? So is this a, are they, in exchange for the information, are they getting some valuable consideration? And assuming that it is a sale of personal information, is Carla's deleting the app, um, is that an opt-out? Is that them directing the business to not sell her information? Uh, under CCPA, there are, they say you've got to have at least two methods, a phone number and a method through the website. So I would say, unless Company C said in its privacy policy, if you delete the app, will th that functions as an opt-out, that probably isn't a sufficient opt-out under CCPA. Um, let's see. 
Lastly, we've got her deletion request. So a year later, she asked the company to delete all information about her. Uh, if she's a Californian, she can't ask for all information to be deleted. Um, she's, it's personal information only. So if there is uh, you know, some kind of anonymization option, that's something that Company C could take advantage of. Um, similarly, under GDPR, uh, you'd want Company C would want to look also to their privacy policy. Sometimes companies, even if they're not legally required to, do make promises in their privacy policies about when they'll delete data. Uh, and then you'd want to consider whether there are exceptions. So both GDPR and CCPA set out fairly broad exceptions for um, deletion. So I'd want to consider whether any of those apply. Thank you. Uh, that is actually an excellent issue spotting. You've covered actually a lot of my follow-up questions, which means you did a great job. <laughs> Uh, but let me let me open it up to the rest of the panel. Um, I would love to know if you guys see any other issues that Tracy didn't cover. And let me actually make that question a little bit different and kind of uh, maybe bring a little bit of the last panel in where Professor um, Fred Kate said, you know, we should be focusing on the harms. I'm curious if you all see any harms or any privacy implications in this hypo that maybe are not covered by any of the laws that Tracy covered. Dave, would yeah, you like to sure. take a crack at yeah, it? Yeah, I actually wanted to respond to a lot of what yeah. Professor Kate said. <laughs> uh, so you kind of opened the door. Um, first of all, the, I, I think the idea of de-identification is, is kind of a myth. Um, and, um, and so when companies start talking about that, uh, I get skeptical. There was years and years ago before, before um, Silicon Valley got really good at figuring out what we do and who we are, uh, uh, Netflix put out a contest to see if people would come up with a better algorithm uh, for, uh, for picking movies. And they put out things that seemed totally innocuous, just, just no names and just here's some movies. And news reporters were able to actually tie that to specific people. And, and the level that, that, um, that the really smart companies are able to do that with is, is shocking. If you have almost any three points of data, geolocation, for example, um, but anything even broader than that, you can find out who somebody is. What, what's really scary to me is that they're selling this information to pharmaceutical companies who could do whoever we, you know, what, whatever we want with it, whatever they want with it. But I, I want to go back to Professor Kate's kind of preliminary point, which is that we shouldn't worry about consent. And I think he didn't have a chance to fully expound upon this, but it makes some intuitive sense. As consumers, who really reads all of these privacy policies? So what does it matter if these companies say, by the way, we're actually going to be tracking all of this stuff um, and then providing it uh, down the line to somebody else? And the answer is not because the consumers read it, but because others read it. Uh, so for example, when Snapchat for a day decided that they weren't going to permanently delete all the snaps, Nobody read that in their privacy policy except the blogger. And then it became big news, and Snapchat said, oh, we can't do this anymore. Um, so I think that's the real reason why consent is so important um, and why companies have to, have to follow that. Yeah, Lothar? Just one point. I would say that the pharma companies, of course, developing new cures that would benefit Carla and many other people, but I'm probably just an optimist on that. And I wanted to add to Tracy's excellent list of issue spotting that we have the California Medical Confidentiality of Medical Information Act on top of the list that she provided that covers with HIPAA-like rules also providers of hardware, software, and online services since 2015 and requires opt-in consent for certain authorizations. They have to be handwritten. That's real fun when you have a mobile app. And they have to be signed in a typeface no smaller than 14-point type, although it doesn't specify the font type, only the size of the font. Clearly separate from any other language presented on the same page, executed by a signature that serves no other purpose than to execute the authorization, signed and dated. Plus, we have a separate law that requires consent for the collection of medical information for direct marketing purposes, at Civil Code 1798-91, cheating here, reading from my own book, but um, making the point that we already have hundreds of laws and I think we didn't need the California Consumer Privacy Act on top of all of these unless we repeal some of them or preempt them on a federal level. Yeah, Alan? 
Uh, so first, uh, just responding to, to Jay on the de-identification, you know, if we can't rely on de-identification, uh, we're really cooked in terms of innovation, picking up on what Lothar said. I mean, these public health advocates want this data for a reason, the pharmaceutical companies as well. You know, progress, innovation will stop, and uh, artificial intelligence will be completely uh, developed elsewhere. So if a statute says, like CCPA, that de and by the way, HIPAA, says that you can work with de-identified data, we should strive for that. And of course, de-identified data, if it's been anonymized, isn't even personal information under the, the GDPR. We could talk for weeks and months and years about pseudonymized data, but I know there are like uh, two minutes left, so uh, we won't. Um, a couple of other issues uh, to note. Um, so Carla wants uh, Company C to delete the information about her. It's not clear from the hypo whether the information that remains with Company C is in de-identified format. But if it were, uh, under the, the CCPA, the, uh, the company would not have the obligation to uh, re-identify uh, Carla from that in order to find it and delete it. Uh, and then um, uh, uh, the request is coming in a year later. Uh, so a year later is about 12 months. So the, the look back provisions uh, are, are um, 12 months for what a company needs to go back. So, you know, maybe depending on when she asks and, and what remains, uh, you know, the company may not uh, be able to find it, re-identify it, uh, and, and uh, delete it 12 months later. Can I, can I follow up? Yes, please, Jay. Uh, Alan, I'm just curious, in terms of, of stifling innovation, so Let's say you're that company, you come to me and I'm the lawyer, and I say, you can do this. You just need to add a sentence saying, by the way, we're going to collect this information, and we're going to send it on, and we're, we're going to try to make it anonymous, and here's how. Um, and that's what we're going to do. You think companies are going to say, ah, it's not worth it? Oh, it, you mean, in other words, if, if you just make disclosure of the de-identification uh, plan in that's advance. All, that's all that's required from most privacy. So. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's right. But, but I, I think also we can assume it. When data is collected, that it is possible. I mean, it's contemplated under HIPAA, under CCPA, under GDPR, uh, you know, I'm sure under uh, other regimes as well, that it can and, and will be de-identified. And, you know, it, uh, under... Uh, HIPAA, to be sure, it's uh, perhaps more regulated if, if the party who's de-identifying it doesn't have full data rights to it. But it, it's, it's sort of a, a standard, right? De-identified data is tantamount to anonymized data, really, and people deal with anonymized data all the time. So I, I don't think it would be hugely burdensome to just say that, you know, we can work, we can de-identify your data and then use it for other socially beneficial purposes or commercial purposes, which is, you know, analogous to socially beneficial. Or we could just assume it, that that's what people are going to do with data, that if they can figure out a way effectively to de-identify it within the uh, consistency of the relevant statutory regime, then they're free to work with it because it's to everybody's benefit. So I have a question from the audience, kind of following up on the discussion between Jay and uh, Alan. And so, Given that there's, um, are my understanding from the audience, <laughs> is that the definition in California of the resident is somewhat wide, and that obviously we have the 12 month look back period. So the question from the audience is, does the wide resident plus look back period essentially create a national right? What are your thoughts on that? So in the sense that because you can't, it's so hard to identify who's a California resident that you will effectively have to give these rights to all Californians. I, I, I know of companies that are considering that, that implementation, that they, they're looking at what data they have about users, and there are some that determine that they don't have sufficient information. It, with the guidance that we've gotten so far from the AG's office, hopefully there'll be something more when we get the regs, um, but that they might have to just apply this nationwide. Okay. Well, since, if we, yes, uh, please, Rebecca. Two thoughts on the, in essence, the de-identification piece. Um, to me, if, if, if we think de-identification actually works, you know, if we believe in it, if we decide whatever the standard is, maybe it's the um, kind of circular piece way that's defined within CCPA, maybe it's the existing FTC standard, maybe we come to something better. But if we believe in that, then there's really no point in, Jay, to your point, notice and consent to people because it, it, like, what are they noticing and what are they consenting to if we believe that in fact 
there's no reasonable chance that they'll be identified. If we don't believe in it, if we think, well, we can do the best we can, but actually a really good college student could figure out who you are from this, then I think we need to, all of us, including recipients, including cities and governments that say they're receiving data in de-identified fashion, need to stop telling consumers and kind of over-promising what, what de-identification means. So I think like you can't answer the question of should consumers have a right to either consent and opt in or opt out from some form of de-identified third party sharing without also coming to a conclusion about what de-identified means and if we actually think that it still exists as a concept. One other piece to your point. Um, may, I, may I just say I agree with you 100%. First time. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> usual. Yeah. Um, uh, there is a way in which even a truly de-identified sharing, so now let's posit a world in which it's really, really good, um, could still, in fact, create some form of personal psychosocial harm to someone. Jay and I probably don't agree on whether that's actionable um, under a law, but what if the public health advocates or the pharmaceutical companies are also receiving other information about these folks? What if they are receiving the race, the age, the ethnicity, the income status um, of these users? And what if they are using that as part of how they're formulating whatever their treatment plans or modalities could be? Um, you know, this history is a pretty bad, our country is a bad history in some sectors of making uh, public health decisions about people from, from um, different races. Um, and maybe there's a person who uses this app and wants the benefits for themselves, but just doesn't want their data to go into that data set, even if it's never going to be associated with them. So that just could be a different, a way in which even de-identified data sharing could present a risk. These are all um, great issues that you've all raised, but um, in the interest of time, we're going to move on to the next typo. So here we have company D, which sells smart coffee makers that can be connected to an alarm clock app. The company installs a microphone, but does not disclose its presence. Three years later, company D announces a software update that will activate the speaker so that it can respond to commands to make coffee. The, co the company will also data mine the voice recordings to improve the product. Calvin Consumer is concerned that Company D may have recorded his conversations. He wants to access all data about him. Uh, Jay, what are the privacy implications about this scenario, and what can Cal Cons Calvin Consumer and his friends do about it? I think they can do a lot, but first, I, I, I just love this hypothetical because it gets to the heart of the debate about privacy. Um, I always think about my mom when I, when I evaluate a privacy case, and I, I ask, would she care about it? And when you look at the, at the hypo just on its face, her answer would be no. What, what do I care? I'm probably not going to use this voice recognition uh, software. If it's in there, there's no harm to me. Uh, Jay, you should, you should become a dentist. Why are you wasting your time with this? <laughs> Here, though, and this was touched on by a previous panel, this is why it matters so much. So the, the first thing I would look at as a plaintiff's attorney is I would actually look at biometrics law. Um, Illinois, for example, uh, uh, the Biometric Information Privacy Protection Act, uh, which has become very active over the last couple of years, talks about voice prints. Um, and what we're seeing is more and more companies, Google and Amazon, for example, are very good about this, where they're, they're uh, using people's voices and identifying people uh, by their voices. So you actually help train their systems so they know when I'm talking to Alexa as opposed to my neighbor. Um, the issue with that, and this was touched on by the last panel, is that once you're able to connect someone to their voice and you're able to track how they speak, you can find out a ton about them. The example given in the last panel was Parkinson's disease, which seems, um, seems somewhat intuitive. Um, there's some other examples which, which are less intuitive. One is uh, researchers be able to figure out whether someone's depressed. Uh, b just by listening to, to recorded versions of their voice over time. Another thing um, is there's an Israeli company um, that claims to be able to come up with personality profiles about people just based on their voice. So they can predict insurance claims, risk of loan defaults, likelihood of employees leaving the, their jobs. This is all the type of stuff which could result because someone got a coffee maker uh, and wanted to be able to say, you know, I want some coffee. Um, so, 
so uh, again, the the I would look at the the biometrics law, Illinois spe specifically, and I would say, did you get proper consent? Beyond that. And I know I sound like a broken record. It always goes back to just general consumer protection statutes. Uh, we have a very similar case. I don't want to mention this. Almost all the hypotheticals, we have some some similar case here. But the one that's that's uh, very similar, we're we're suing uh, Bose. You know the the uh, high end headphones, um, and we allege that they were capturing some information, not telling people. Um, and we sued them under consumer fraud uh, uh, statutes and also uh, wiretap. Uh, claims. Um, the court accepted the consumer fraud claims, and when it came to damages, something which I would bet some of these people will be skeptical about, they accepted our argument, which is that people are overpaying for a product if they don't understand that that product is secretly spying on them. So uh, when we bring these cases, we, we bring experts and we do surveys and say, okay, how much would you pay for this nice set of, of Bose headphones? And someone says, whatever, I don't know what the price is. I get cheap headphones, but $400, $800, whatever it is. Um, then they say, OK, now they're secretly uh, recording uh, the songs that you're listening to. How much would you pay for that? And the answer is significantly less. Um, and so those are the types of theories that, that, uh, that we'd be focused on and that are really starting to pick up steam. Would anyone else like to respond to anything that Jay raised or anything in this hypothetical? I would also be thinking about, it wasn't clear to me from the hypo, are they getting a consent for the software update? Is it an automatic software update that gets pushed out such that you don't know that the microphone is suddenly recording you? Um, is there a wake word so that it's only recording me when I indicate that it should be recording me? Or is it just going to always be on um, and always recording? And if, if that's the case, then I would be thinking about ECBA and state wire tape, tap law concerns for recording conversations. I would just highlight that Jay's mom wouldn't have paid less for this coffee machine because she didn't care. And I think that makes the point on some of this harm um, argument or speculation here. The other point I would make is that the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act already prohibits accessing other people's machines without consent to collect information. That's an old federal law that we already have. And we do have for example, in California, eavesdropping statutes that would capture if wiretapping doesn't apply. So I think we already have, again, to make this point, myriad laws that probably already covered this. And I think the California Consumer Privacy Act was not necessary for this one. Since my mom was invoked, I, I have to her. <laughs> she, would, she would care because if you said you're tracking, uh, it depends what the implications are. If, if they're not doing anything with it at all, um, and uh, they're not storing this information, they're not doing what these Israeli companies are doing or other companies, and they're trying to figure out who my mom is and, and what her social uh, well-being is like, then she probably doesn't care, and there's probably not a very good claim out there for that. But if they're doing all those nasty things, her view would be, and I know this because she's my mom, uh, her view would be, uh, I don't want to buy this for any cost, and that's really what we're seeing, that if the companies are misusing the data and, and um, not telling people what they're doing with it, most, most people, they don't say, I, well, I'll still buy it, but for $20 less. Most people say, you know what, I'll buy different headphones or I'll buy a different coffee maker. Is, is Company D going to, um, in addition to activating the, the microphone for voice activation of making coffee, um, is it going to impose an additional charge on um, uh, Calvin, uh, because all of a sudden the device has more features, um, and is it going to impose that charge, uh, you know, uh, surreptitiously without, uh, you know, getting uh, uh, opt-in? Um, and also, is it going to start a subscription service that will also, you know, uh, pull the uh, Calvin uh, or Jay's mom? Uh, would you like me to order coffee for you? And uh, and then uh, all kinds of other, uh, you know, commercial applications like that. Um, you know, clearly uh, this this is something that shouldn't be done surreptitiously. But if an additional feature is activated. Uh, by the company. Again, one could look at that as, as progress or getting something for free, if it's disclosed, uh, obviously. But it, it isn't necessarily all that different from improvements in firmware uh, that, uh, or software uh, 
um, that uh, you know are just are, are mediated through through code rather than having a you know a physical uh, speaker and microphone uh, in the device that that people didn't know. So would you not want you know it's, it's, again firmware and software updates that um, resulted in the possibility of being uh, eavesdropped on? Yes, that should clearly be disclosed as well. But you you could really look on the bright side and say. Wow, my you know my product uh, has uh, has just improved for free. So let's assume here that the software update that will activate the speakers also brings with it um, security uh, updates, uh, bug fixes, since updates are often bundled. So if the only way to uh, forego activation of the speaker is to um, ignore that whole update and miss out on these bug fixes and security updates. Um, is that problematic? Yes. <laughs> I agree. And does current law uh, adequately address that situation? And Alan, you had a, you had a very affirmative, uh, uh, strong reaction to that. So how? Yeah. No. I mean that it does. That that seems. You know, I don't think, uh, put myself in, in your shoes, I don't think the Federal Trade Commission would have a tough time thinking, well, maybe there's some, something unfair, deceptive about that. Maybe it was, you know, and uh, this was a, 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 a take it uh, or leave it uh, proposition where uh, uh, there, there's, you know, there's an intrusion here, uh, the possibility, again, there may be other controls on it and that, that the hypothetical may not, uh, fully address in terms of uh, security control so that there's no chance that there's going to be an inadvertent activation of this without the consumer's knowledge. Uh, but, um, you know, if, if the idea here is to uh, put the consumer in a position of possibly being exposed to being inadvert unintentional to, to the consumer recorded, you know, then burying it uh, with, with other security updates uh, you know, that, that would seem unfair, and if it's disclosed inconspicuously, potentially deceptive. Yeah, I think the FTC could arguably bring in, that would be a place where you could actually bring an unfairness case and have a, like, a tangible privacy injury, which would be, I paid $50 for this coffee maker. I was not told it was going to record me. Um, now it records me. I'm assuming that it's not. There's no wake word. There's no opt-in. There's no way to turn it off. And I'm now out $50. Like, that would be a tangible harm. I think it probably depends, though, exactly what the security risks are that we're talking about that you will not be getting the patch for. I mean, it sounds from the hypo that if you don't install this update, the only thing that's really smart about your coffee maker is that it can connect to your alarm clock app. You know, even if that were hacked, kind of, I mean, you know, I, I don't know, maybe, but it just seems like we need to think through because if, if you're not getting that update and you're choosing not to activate the speaker aspect to it, perhaps the risk to you of any, you know, there's no actual real risk. Like, what's going to happen? From, Although, is a consumer you know, ever in a position to make that judgment, right? right? Like, how bad is this bug? Or well, how? if we're looking at it under unfairness, then the consumer doesn't have to make that decision. I mean, unfairness isn't about notice or consent anyway. Right, but there might not actually be an unfair situation. But it, does the consumer really have a choice? If they're being told this is a patch to update a bug and they don't know if this bug is catastrophic, they, they're going to ha kind of have to install it. And now they've got a machine that's recording it where they didn't consent to it. And <laughs> should we be taking into account um, third party externalities? So if the bug would affect, um, uh, you know, uh, gets hacked, it becomes part of a botnet and there are external harms. Spotnet of coffee makers. <laughs> <laughs>